Okay. Um, Jordan, is it cool to move on to the second poll? Okay. I, yep. I'm a little disoriented with the two different screens. So just trying to, I can't see everything. Um, so thank you for, for answering that. Jordan, do you mind just shouting out quickly where, where folks are saying they're from? Because I can't see it for some reason. Sure. Looks like we've got Massachusetts, Washington, D.C., Chicago, New Jersey, a couple folks from Chicago, Texas, New York, Denver, St. Paul, Minnesota, Maryland, more Texas, Miami, Florida. Hey, and you've got a North Carolina, uh, North Carolinian with you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, thank you. And Jordan, do we have one more poll? We do. Okay. Let's go ahead and put that up really quickly. So our question, um, this poll is, which session on today's agenda are you most looking forward to? We have a jam-packed uh, workshop today. We're covering um, funding, sustainability, how, how might states um, and districts do that. We are covering how to identify key decision makers and target them with your messaging and how do, how do you do that effectively. And then at the end, we have some networking. So really curious to know where people are, you know, gunning to, to learn more um, in today's uh, workshop. And I can see the poll now and it looks like the first two are super popular. So we will be uh, transitioning to our first session soon. Um, I would show up for those two if I was in a state you know, in a district trying to figure out what's next. So we're super uh, glad that we have the folks here today to share their expertise. Okay, I'm gonna close out the poll, Jordan, so we can move on. All right, thank you. Um, so as I said, um, we have a full session today. We're going to start by doing a little bit of a recap of Wednesday. If you weren't here, we are then going to transition to talking about sustaining high impact investments beyond ESSER. We're gonna be joined by CCSO. And then we are going to do even a little bit of a deeper dive into um, how states can braid and blend federal funds, um, giving you some on the ground real, uh, real world examples of what that can look like. Um, we're going to talk then about identifying key budget decision makers, because that's really important in this moment. We're going to talk about how you lobby those folks effectively once you identify them. We are going to do some networking at, at the end so we can have um, collective conversations um, and reflections on our sessions today. And then we're going to close out. So um, if you have to come in and out, no worries. Um, but this is our schedule for the day. So uh, just wanted to give a recap of Wednesday's session. Um, Nicholas uh, and I, we gave an overview of what is in both of our uh, Esther sustainability briefs. Nicholas's brief came out earlier this summer. It really focuses on, you know, before we even talk about sustainability, we need to make sure that we identify which programs are having the most impact for our students. We know that the money is running out. Um, districts are facing other budget pressures, and we need to have effective ways of identifying where districts and states can continue to invest. Um, and Jordan uh, shared those uh, links to our briefs, and we will make sure that we share those again, um, either in the chat today or we will do a follow-up email as well. Um, another thing that we focused on, on in Wednesday's session is that there are key data that can help districts and states, um, sorry for the typo, there are districts and states, um, there, there are, there's data that can help districts and states prioritize programs, engage their, engage their fiscal cliff. Um, the fiscal cliff conversation is not a new one. Um, districts and states have been here before, but in this exact moment, it's really important for states and districts to be looking at the data that they have to decide 
you know, what they can continue to prioritize, which districts are going to be at the most risk, and how might states respond um, and support those districts. And then lastly, we had a really, really fun conversation with our comms director, Amisha Cross, who um, reminded us that we are all spokespeople for equity and we can use media uh, effectively to shape the narrative. And so if you weren't in that session, I highly recommend that you watch the recording because Amisha got all of us together. She uh, gave real time feedback. We were able to um, do some pitches with like how we would um, pitch to a reporter about our narratives um, in our respective states or districts. And um, I think that session will relate really well to our conversation about identifying key decision makers and how to effectively lobby them as well. Um, and the media can actually help us like elevate um, those conversations that we want to have uh, with our targets. So again, if you were not here, please um, go back and watch that recording. Um, if you uh, registered for day one, but you couldn't attend, uh, we uh, we just had such a good time. And I'm very thankful uh, to Amisha for, for uh, leading that session. So um, we are going to start the day uh, with Austin Estes and Peter Samora from the Council of the Chief State School uh, Officers who are going to talk about the options states and districts have for measuring impact and sustaining high impact investments beyond the ESSER deadline that is uh, next September, September 30th, uh, 2024. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, the Council of the Chief State School Officers, or CCSSO, is a nonpartisan nationwide nonprofit organization of public officials who head departments of elementary and secondary education in the states, the District of Columbia, the Department of Defense Education Activity, and the Bureau, Bureau of Indian Education in the five uh, U.S. extra state jurisdictions. So Austin and Peter can tell you even more about their organization, um, but I am going to pass it over to them. All right, thank you so much, Kabila. Um, let me get my slides up real quick. Uh, is that coming through? Perfect. Um, well, first of all, thanks for uh, having us uh, this morning to to speak with you all. We're it sounds like a, a really exciting and really uh, engaging program. Uh, I'm glad that we can be part of it. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague uh, Peter Zamora, who's the director of federal relations and policy at CCSSO, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, both what we're seeing in terms of the impact of state level ESSER investments and then some ways that states are, are thinking about sustainability as we approach that, um, the ARP ESSER obligation deadline next September. Um, I uh, don't need to re restate who we are, but uh, again, as, as Kabila so uh, eloquently shared, we, we represent the state, uh, the chief state school officers uh, across the nation. And as an organization, um, our vision is to ensure that all students participate in public education uh, across backgrounds and graduate prepared for college, careers, and life. And our organization works to support the chief state school officers through leadership, advocacy, and service. And we do this by uh, influencing, leading, and connecting, as we've articulated in our uh, most recent 2021-2026 strategic plan. Uh, so that's just a little bit about who we are as an organization, um, if you haven't heard of us or worked with us before. Uh, so now on to, on to uh, why we are here today. Um, last year, CCSSO launched a project called the COVID Relief Data Project to get a better understanding of how state education agencies are using the 10% set aside allocated for SEA use under the ESSER program. And through this effort, we've been able to track down a lot of data on how states are, are directing those funds and get a clear picture of how states are prioritizing their recovery effort, efforts and the impact of those investments that states are making. 
And we have just to kind of put a plug out there for our uh, for more resources. All of this information that I'm sharing today is available at ccsso.org slash ESSER funds. I know you all are very familiar with, with the ESSER program, but just as a quick refresher and a little bit of context setting, uh, this program was first authorized under the CARES Act in 2020, ultimately uh, provided about $190 billion to support relief and recovery in K-12 schools across the nation. Um, these are largely flexible funds the underlying authority for the use of funds is any other uh, existing federal education program. So there's really a broad uh, a range of activities that states and districts and schools can support with this money. The, the little gray slice that you see in this pie chart here, that's the 10% that state education agencies could set aside uh, for statewide use. And that amounts to about $19 billion total. So it's just a, a slice of the pie relative to all of the money that went out to districts. But this is also a significant amount of uh, largely discretionary funding that SEAs can use. And so we've we've been able to see some interesting uh, trends in the way that states are, are using that funding to prioritize the recovery effort. Uh, and then uh, as you are all aware we are quickly approaching the September 2024 obligation deadline for the final round of funding. We just passed the deadline for uh, the ESSER II funds, uh, which uh, were uh, must have been obligated last month. And then uh, by next September, uh, those funds must be either spent or obligated uh, with the potential for some late spending uh, for certain types of activities. Uh, but really, September 30th, 2024 is the deadline that we're, we're looking at here. So when we look across the country and we look at all three rounds of funding, what we've been seeing is that state education agencies using their 10% state set aside have been really doubling down on academic recovery. Um, so we've documented a little over $4 billion collectively across states that is supporting uh, efforts to address unfinished learning through tutoring and accelerated learning and other related activities. We've also seen a little over $3 billion supporting summer and after school programs, as well as investments in curriculum and instruction, in remote learning opportunities, in post secondary and career readiness, uh, and other kind of more academic focused uh, investments and initiatives. While states have been primarily focusing on academic recovery. We also have seen a pretty significant investment in the educator workforce. So about $1.5 billion there, uh, as well as a, a little over a billion dollars supporting efforts to uh, support uh, well-being and mental health for not only students, but also teachers uh, and others within the school building. So it gives you a sense of how states are prioritizing their recovery efforts and how they're using the uh, incredible amount of funding that they received from the federal government. And before we start the conversation around sustainability, I wanna quickly highlight some of what we're seeing in terms of impact from the investments that states are making. And as uh, Kibila mentioned earlier, starting with the evidence of impact, can really help prioritize and, and inform uh, efforts around sustainability. So if, we, if we're if we able to see what's working, um, that can help uh, not only make the case, but also uh, for practitioners at the state and district level can help them think about how they wanna prioritize uh, limited resources and focus on what's having the greatest impact for students. So when it comes to high impact tutoring, we've documented 18 states so far that have uh, put money behind uh, statewide large scale high impact tutoring initiatives that are anchored in some of those research based principles around uh, frequency, ratio, scheduling, use of instructional materials, et cetera. And the approach that states take kind of varies. Um, some states have been focusing more on recruitment and deployment of tutors. Others are really focusing on uh, training and use of instructional materials. Um, but really, it's about a half a billion dollars across 18 states supporting high impact tutoring efforts. 
That doesn't include other district-led efforts, uh, as well as other inv state-level investments in you know, access to private tutoring services, access to on-demand virtual tutoring providers, and others. And while it's still early to see uh, rigorous causal impacts from these investments, we do have some leading indicators that state-led tutoring programs are reaching the students that they intend to reach and are starting to have an impact. So you can see in Colorado and Ohio, um, they've logged thousands of hours of, uh, of tutoring and have reached a lot of students across the state. And in Arkansas, uh, tutors that the state has recruited have reported uh, seeing progress in academic growth in the students they're working with. When we look at curriculum and instruction, we're also seeing a pretty significant investment in this area. Uh, states have been using their funding to, uh, to identify, encourage, uh, incentivize, and support the adoption and use of high quality instructional materials in the classroom. And we've also seen a lot of support for uh, math and reading in particular, which is really where a lot of the academic impact has been. Um, and where there's been, uh, particularly in literacy, where there's been a lot of movement across states even before the pandemic. I do want to note one interesting trend is that uh, 27 states have used a little over half a billion dollars of their state ESSER funding to advance initiatives that are anchored in the science of reading. Uh, so there's really uh, uh, growing momentum around science-based literacy initiatives that we're seeing across states. Uh, and this is only looking at states that are using their ESSER money. A lot of other states have put state funding behind that work as well. Uh, when it comes to math, a uh, number of states are, are partnering with, uh, are using uh, kind of computer-based tools and other acceleration strategies in the classroom. Uh, Zern is one provider that has been doing its own independent research and was able to document an impact for frequent users in both Louisiana and Nebraska. And then in, uh, when it comes to after school and summer programs, we've seen a lot of money supporting these activities, uh, recognizing that there's only so much time in the school day and uh, providing additional support outside of school time can help students not only catch up academically, but also ensure that they're, they're uh, receiving the uh, enrichment and uh, well-being supports uh, outside of the school day. In total, states have dedicated more than $1.5 billion for multi-purpose out-of-school time programs that include multiple goals, not just academic support, but also enrichment, uh, physical activity, et cetera. But there's also more than a billion dollars that's been dedicated towards academically focused programs, such as the Massachusetts Acceleration Academy, which is providing uh, several additional hours of instruction in math for students who need uh, the additional support to catch up. And then, as I mentioned before, teacher recruitment and retention is a major priority across states. We've seen investments both in emergency needs. So a lot of states early on were dedicating money to, to, for retention bonuses, for emergency substitute teachers. But then a lot of states have, have been focusing as well on kind of the long-term system building work. Uh, and in order to strengthen the pipeline of diverse educators who are entering the profession. So we've been able to document uh, about $230 million supporting educator workforce pipeline programs like Grow Your Own initiatives or registered teacher apprenticeship programs and $55 million for induction and mentoring programs for new teachers. And in some states, those, those investments are already paying off. So Missouri partnered with a researcher to uh, conduct a multi-year evaluation of their teacher retention, recruitment, and Grow Your Own grants. And the recipients of their Grow Your Own grants have already shown, 60% of them have already shown that they're seeing increased interest in teacher positions. So that's an incredible impact uh, from that investment. And that's the kind of impact that's going to uh, pay dividends in schools and districts across the state for years to come, long after the ESSER obligation deadline is passed. And then the last trend that I want to highlight is the statewide uh, and national focus on well-being and mental health. 
We've seen more than a billion dollars dedicated towards activities to support social and emotional learning, mental health and physical health services for students, in particular telehealth services that can reach uh, rural schools and communities that maybe don't have a school nurse or a school psychologist on staff. Uh, and then also support for recruitment of school psychologists and nurses. And Missouri and Nebraska are two states that have uh, invested in training for teachers and school staff and have been able to reach uh, several um, teachers and, and uh, school leaders across their states. So I know we're here today to talk about sustainability, and this is a, a question that's on the top of minds for uh, for many people. Uh, just to quickly frame the, the conversation around sustainability, though, uh, we're seeing kind of two uh, kind of approaches to thinking about sustainability. And one is uh, con continuing to address the uh, many needs that students have as they recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's some research that's come out that's shown uh, students are going to need ongoing support for learning acceleration for a few more years, uh, even after the ESSER funds are no longer available to help them uh, fully catch up to where they were before the pandemic not to mention all of the other the needs that students have uh, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so those are investments that maybe could be uh, scaled down over time as the effects of the pandemic recede, but there's still some more support needed after next fall. The other lens is thinking about all of the innovations that states and districts have made uh, with their ESSER money and what we've learned from new approaches and new interventions and new programs that they have funded with that, uh, with their relief money. And could those investments uh, continue to have an impact for students uh, outside of a pandemic environment? Um, and so there might be a case to make there to sustain some of those, those activities. Uh, before I hand it over to Peter, I just wanna quickly highlight some examples of states that are doing some uh, creative work around sustainability. So we've, been, we've seen this kind of fall into four different uh, camps. One is a focus on using data and evaluation to inform financial decision-making. And states like Connecticut and North Carolina are great examples of state education agencies that are partnering with researchers, with colleges and universities to evaluate the ongoing impact of the pandemic and the impact of their ESSER investments. So if you look at the work that Connecticut has been doing through the, the COVID Education Research Collaborative, they're studying the impact of their summer learning programs, of their home visiting programs, of their uh, behavioral health investments, and that will help them understand what is working and what isn't working uh, and inform their own strategy around sustainability after ESSER. North Carolina also has a pretty broad research agenda that the state education agency is supporting. And they've been doing a lot of work with the field to help districts understand uh, their own students' needs and use their resources uh, effectively to meet those needs. Another focus is uh, securing commitments of additional state funding this is entirely state context dependent. So there are some states that have the uh, fiscal environment and political environment where they've been able to uh, secure additional funding for some of these programs. So for example, Colorado has, uh, has put some state money behind their high impact tutoring program. And that's a program that, that is funded, uh, I believe through 2025. So there are resources that are available even after the ESSER uh, funding is gone. Uh, Nevada as well has put some state money behind a, a program that they started with their ESSER funds to incentivize teachers into the, the profession. Uh, so that's a commitment that the state has, has kind of doubled down on and put their own resources behind. And then Tennessee similarly uh, has put a lot of, uh, has, has recently restructured its uh, per pupil student funding formula and put additional state dollars behind that funding formula, which means that there are more resources going to districts now, and that districts receiving that funding uh, might be able to sustain some of the staff and initiatives that they're funding with ESSER. Uh, I do want to note, though, that this uh, really depends on the, the state's fiscal environment and uh, 
pursuing additional state funding uh, isn't always feasible depending on the state context. Uh, on that note, there are ways that states can, uh, and districts and schools can use their available resources, recurring state and federal funds, uh, effectively to uh, sustain some of their asset priorities uh, by braiding and blending funds. Just a couple quick examples, North Carolina used their ESSER money uh, and braided that with some of their Title II funds to create this assistant, the Assistant Principal Accelerator Program. So they're working with uh, talented, aspiring future principals to, to train them and then match them with, with schools that are in need of strong school leaders. It's been a very effective program so far. And because they're using Title II funds for that, there's already uh, a system in place for them to to continue to fund that program using that funding stream. And then New Jersey and Illinois are both two states that have put out resources that are available to the public uh, and to their districts to examine ways to, to braid uh, existing funds to support is, uh, initiatives like high impact tutoring or other, um, other acceleration opportunities. And then lastly, another strategy that we've been seeing is states using their one-time dollars to make one-time investments to kind of lay a foundation for future work. And what I mean by that is support for, for training, uh, building the capacity of regional intermediaries who could then train schools and districts. And that knowledge is retained after the ESSER funds have been used. Uh, so Nebraska uh, launched this math acceleration project with their education service centers and uh, trained them to provide coaching to educators in their regions around effective uses of high quality instructional materials. That's been a very impactful program and something that they can sustain for relatively uh, low cost using recurring funds in the future, now that the training and in, in the uh, design of the program has been uh, uh, created with their ESSER funds. North Dakota as well has a similar approach through the Greater Math in North Dakota program where they're training regional intermediaries who can then train uh, districts and schools into the future. So those are just a few ways that states are thinking about sustainability. Um, at CCSSO, we are constantly in conversation with state leaders and we plan to highlight some of their, uh, some state examples and effective work uh, on our, our website into the future. Uh, and again, just to make a plug for our resources, if you go to ccsso.org slash ESSER funds, we have a number of reports. We are documenting impact data from state ESSER investments. And we include uh, much more information and we'll continue to update that website with more uh, sustainability examples over the coming year. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter to walk us through the next portion of uh, our presentation. Thanks very much, Austin, and uh, thanks also to Education Trust for including us in this important discussion. We really value our partnership with you all, and so I'm going to be kind of speaking from my perspective as the Director of Federal Relations, and you know, Austin gave some excellent examples of states that are looking at blending and braiding federal funds as a mechanism for sustaining positive ESSER-funded investments. Um, but before I dig in, I just wanted to do a little bit of sort of table setting here as to kind of how we and how states are approaching this question, state educational agencies. So you know, as I'm sure you all know, um, local educational agencies, uh, school districts um, receive the lion's share of federal formula grants, your ESEA, your IDEA funds. But these are state administered programs, which means that really the relationship is between the US Department of Education and state educational agencies who are our members. And so uh, there is substantial discretion at the local level to align student needs with uh, sort of available federal formula funds. Um, but our members, SEAs, have a critical role in these state administered programs. So um, first of all, uh, the school districts apply to state educational agencies for the majority of their federal formula funds. And that's a really critical process to, to support alignment. 
Um, also, states provide uh, non-regulatory guidance uh, to school districts around you know, the allowability of different activities and in, in uh, federal formula funds and just generally around sort of management and, and oversight. And then, of course, they uh, um, states manage the audit process. You know, any uh, entity that receives over seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars in in federal formula dollars has to do a single audit. And then SEAs are also charged with monitoring uses of funds. And so that just kind of structurally states, uh, you know, even though most of the money passes through them down to districts, have a huge influence in kind of how districts do approach their federal dollars. And so this is you know, work that CCSSO has been doing for quite a while, supporting states around implementation of federal programs. But that has really ramped up over the last couple of years, given that there was um, you know, a new program, uh, new programs uh, created under the COVID relief um, laws, and then now particularly looking at the sunset of the ESSER dollars, as Austin said, you know, coming up in less than a year, uh, really there is an opportunity for states to lean in and to support uh, you know, districts thinking differently around uses of federal funds. Um, based upon the fact that student needs have changed and, you know, that ESSER funded activities are going to go away. So just one kind of important example here is, you know, Title I Part A, uh, you know, the largest uh, federal formula dollar, uh, federal formula program. It was funded at um, almost $18.5 billion uh, in fiscal year 23, uh, the one that just finished. Um, but, you know, Title I it does not have kind of a, a, an enumerated list of allowable costs. There's a lot of sort of flexibility in there. Um, but, you know, No Child Left Behind and Title I, you know, because of the focus on reading and math and, uh, assessment, you know, is often perceived uh, wrongly to be a program that's really limited to reading and math uh, instruction and costs that are associated with that. And you know, to be clear, you know, if that's what um, a student population needs, uh, then those are clearly allowable uses. But that's sort of unduly limiting uh, to view Title I through that lens. So you know, many of the activities that students received kind of newly under ESSER are in fact allowable under Title I. Uh, there are some sort of fiscal rules. There are uh, student eligibility rules that you know we won't kind of go deep into the weeds here. And I think you have a session coming up immediately after this around blending and braiding funds. So maybe we can get into that uh, a little bit there. Um, but you know, counseling, you know, many students have gotten mental health supports, counseling, um, specialized in structural supports and mentoring services. And um, Austin has captured a lot of these on our ESSER funds page that we were highlighting here a moment ago. Um, but also community school models. There's been uh, a lot of energy in districts and states to kind of bolster that approach, uh, even pre-pandemic and, and certainly emerging from the pandemic, uh, you can use Title I for that purpose. You know, there's a separate federal ed education program, a much smaller federal education program, the Full Service Community Schools Program, um, but that is not uh, the only federal funding stream that can be used for that purpose. And, and Title I is the biggest that you know definitely uh, demands uh, some attention, um, but you know we can sort of go over some of these. But expanded course opportunities, you know, making AP classes available more broadly, uh, instructional materials. Austin presented some examples of state ESSER investments, uh, uh, both well, both the ESSER investments and the focus on sustaining um, parent and community engagement. You know, obviously a priority for a lot of different folks. Um, so. Uh, as we you know gaze forward at the kind of sunset of federal funds, um, this is a, a range of uh, different activities that uh, Title I can support. And so we're encouraging states to work with their districts to kind of re-examine how Title I dollars are being spent now and if necessary to realign them you know moving forward uh, for the next budget window. And so just the last kind of a uh, couple more points, uh, you know, what can advocates do? Um, again, sort of noting this sunset of funds, uh, there is an opportunity to coordinate both with local leaders and with state leaders kind of based upon their authority over federal programs to encourage them to look at, at formula dollars as a way 
to sustain uh, ESSER funded activities, but then also to you know, better align with uh, student needs as they exist right now. Um, and then I, I do want to conclude with uh, a sort of a caveat that you know I'm presenting around the universe of allowability, um, but there are certainly a lot of rules that attach to federal dollars, both fiscal rules, student eligibility rules, reporting rules. Um, and so uh, it is very context dependent. What may be allowable in one district may not be allowable um, if it's not necessary and reasonable in another district or what may be allowable in one state may not be uh, viewed as allowable in the next state. But uh, really I think this is an important focus as we look at uh, you know, 2024 and you know, the future of public education after that. And so yeah, we're, uh, as, as Austin said, really prioritizing this strand of work in our supports for states. Um, so uh, we'll just uh, note, we've published a number of different resources uh, in this space recently, one on uh, summer and after school programs, another on uh, looking at federal dollars to support student well being, uh, and, and also staff well being. And uh, we are continuing to develop additional publications and continuing to, to support our state educational agency members. And just uh, appreciate this discussion and the ability to coordinate with EdTrust and, and folks on the call. Um, so there it is. Uh, really appreciate this discussion and um, welcome any questions folks might have. Thank you, Austin and Peter. I know I um, have questions, but I do want to allow um, folks to uh, ask any questions that they have. Um, maybe share any insights, like what are you doing um, in your state right now that might be helpful for folks to hear? What are maybe some of the challenges that you're running into, um, et cetera? Well, I can get us started. I, I know I have a question. Um, you talked a lot, you both talked a lot about impact, right? And so one of the questions that I had is, are there any best practices in data tracking um, and analysis of like program impact that y'all are seeing? Um, yeah, that's just a question that like came out the top of my head when I was listening in. I, I can speak to that. And then Peter, if you have anything to add, um, I I don't know if I'd say best practices necessarily, but we are seeing states play a an important leadership role here in kind of setting up these research partnerships and evaluating the impact of of their uh, statewide ESSER investments. Um, you know, I think I saw a recent uh, tally that twenty eight or so states have these state led uh, evaluations of their ESSER program. So. Um, that's pretty considerable. Um, so there's there is a lot of work that's happening. I think one um, thing that I'm encouraged to see is that uh, states like Missouri have been releasing early data about the implementation of their investments. So Missouri has a multi-year evaluation of their teacher retention and recruitment and grow your own program grants. So they're able to show over time how that program is reaching uh, districts and supporting schools. Um, I think real rigorous causal research takes time. And so getting early indicators out into the field is is um, uh, really valuable. So I'm encouraged to see that from uh, from a number of states. Peter, is there anything else that you would you would add to that? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Austin. And I also want to address Samantha's. I was kind of going to raise a point that's uh, related to Samantha Wilkerson's question here in the chat, which I'll just read for folks. 
Um, Samantha notes that she's from New Jersey and they're having an issue with transparency. Uh, whenever uh, someone says, hey, we haven't spent this money, the response is there's a reporting delay. Uh, how can we learn the truth? Um, the point I was going to make even before Samantha put that in there is skepticism or to sort of encourage uh, that you take with a grain of salt the federal reporting, you know, the COVID transparency uh, dashboard. Uh, and Austin can also speak to this, but there is a significant delay um, in the process for states to collect data from locals, then submit it to the federal government, and then it takes several months even after the states do uh, collect that data for it to then you know, be cleaned up and appear on the ESSER transparency dashboard. And so when you're looking at that, um, there is not uh, at the federal level real time data, but you know you're really looking, you know, six or eight or even more months backwards. Um, so it is kind of a post facto reporting mechanism. There will be another reporting window that will open up next spring, but it'll probably be you know less next fall or later um, before that actually gets published at the federal level. So uh, a number of states, and I can't speak to New Jersey specifically have been uh, have created state dashboards that are providing real time. Uh, we even have one state that's updating it daily uh, that does present kind of a more accurate and that it's more timely, uh, the, the reporting that's happening on the state dashboards. But um, it's been a real challenge for us at the federal level. Um, and you know there are proposals uh, in Congress to significantly cut uh, our federal formula dollars because there's this misperception that you know the funding has not been spent. Um, but we can definitely speak to and, and Austin, I'll give you a chance to speak to this if you'd like. Um, that uh, that again, like the public discussion around the sort of timeline, um, which is partly fed into by uh, the lag in the federal reporting, um, is just inaccurate. So I think that the best way to learn the truth really is to engage directly with states and districts that do you know have. Uh, real-time data. But Austin, I wonder if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, just anecdotally, I've done a little bit of kind of cross-referencing uh, of the state dashboards with the federal dashboards. And I find that the federal data tends to lag state reported data by about eight to 10 percentage points. So just keep that in mind. And then the data that states are reporting, because the funds are reimbursed uh, for expenditures that districts have already made, um, there's a built-in lag period um, of maybe a month or, or two as those funds are being processed before they're reported out in the state dashboard. So the states are the best information for uh, where spending is, but even there, it's not going to be uh, real-time data. There's going to be a built-in lag. So um, just I, I would start by looking to see if your state has a dashboard, uh, but just kind of keep that context in mind. Great. Um, I was writing down a bunch of what you were saying, and I appreciate you emphasizing where we could get the best data, even with the caveats. Um, but I think that is something that folks are always wondering, like, where do we get this data? And then even if we have the data, how trustworthy um, is the data? And we know that, like, you know, governments, they like to make decisions and, and move Quick, more quickly sometimes than the data may allow. And so um, I'm hoping that, you know, as folks heard that, um, you could go back to your state um, and really push there and emphasize there. But also as we talk about what's um, needed, we contextualize that like the data we have is the best data we have, but there's probably still more data that can tell us a fuller story about um, what we need to do to prioritize students. And I definitely um, was interested in this balance of like, we don't have as much data as we need on what's working, time is running out, but then there's also a narrative now about that there's some, some districts that are at risk of not even spending all their money, right? And so um, I guess my question in there is just like, I don't know if it's like, how do we cut through that noise? Or like, how do we focus like the conversation? Maybe like how might people focus the conversation in their state, um, you know, reflecting on like keeping us focused on impact, keeping us focused on 
what's needed next. I don't know if y'all have anything to say on that, but that is like a question that came up for me as I'm listening to you all talk about like data lags and um, things like that. So I don't know if there's a response, but we can move on to another question if not. Yeah, I can um, try to respond. And I also saw a comment in the chat as well around schools that are that have used little to none of their ESSER funds. Um, I, I will admit that I don't have a close perspective on local spending because we've been primarily looking at the state level spending. Um, but one uh, one thing I would keep in mind is that every, um, you know, some districts maybe haven't spent much of their money, but they might not have received that large of a share of ESSER funds relative to their operating, uh, general operating funds. So I'd keep that in mind when you're looking at um, uh, how much has been spent. And then also we, we know that there have been challenges around uh, with, with labor and supply chain issues. So some districts might have uh, set aside funding for, for example, HVAC repairs and have been working to, to find um, contractors who can provide those services. And so that might be a large expense that will be paid down uh, at a later date um, due to supply chain issues. So that the money, the money may, they may have a plan for it, or it may even be obligated because there may be a contract in place, but it just hasn't been spent. Um, so again, like it, it, it's so hard to paint with kind of a universal brush of, of what these challenges look like, because it's so dependent on the local context, on whether the district has obligated those funds already, whether they have a plan to spend them down. Um, so I'd keep that in mind when you're, you're engaging with, uh, local leaders. Um, Peter, what else would you, what, what would you add? No, I think that was a great, um, uh, response and, you know, obviously, you know, we work with states, so can't, you know, speak to the decision-making around any, you know, individual district, but I think that the point that you make here around the sort of lag time and the, the point around these are, um, administered on a reimbursement basis, you know, so um, states and districts have, uh, you know, at a minimum 120 days after the obligation deadline to liquidate the funds, to basically sort of cash the checks to meet the commitments that they've made to the obligations. And so, you know, we won't even know, you know, how much um, actually has been spent out of ESSER too, you know, even though the date to obligate has already passed, we won't know that until January of next year. So it really is kind of a lagging uh, indicator. But I do want to note, and I, I think that ESSER has really elevated the issue of just how very hard it is to spend federal money um, for, you know, students in need. So, um, you know, there are incredibly complicated processes for states to apply. You know, states had to develop a plan to submit to the Department of Education. LEAs had developed plans to submit to the SEAs. Um, LEAs ha have to actually make the expenditures with local funds, then submit for reimbursement to the state level. So um, it's super complicated. And then also, you know, the federal reporting challenges that we've had around these uh, funds. So um, the fact that it's not particularly useful data has not um, pre prevented the federal um, reporting from being incredibly challenging uh, at the state and local levels in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the amount of data that's collected and reported um, both annually and monthly, it's, it's, it's hugely challenging to implement. So um, I think there's maybe some takeaways that we can learn from this process that could inform sort of future uh, processes around federal grants administration. And we're working with states on that, but um, it's been a super challenging few years uh, for the field. Yeah, thank you for that. We had um, another question. Um, we have two questions. Um, there was a question, there's a question about how do you recommend earmarking available funds for beyond September, 2024? I don't know if y'all have an answer to that. Um, I'll, I'll just note, you I mean, this sort of brings to mind to me, there has been a lot of um, discussion around quote unquote late liquidation of ESSER funds. Um, the Department of Education, the U.S. Department has put out a process that states can apply to give more dis districts more time 
Um, that is a really challenging process and one that um, a lot of states have concerns with. So even though some states have um, uh, gotten uh, some permission to spend the money a little bit longer, uh, that is definitely not the default. And so I, I don't know if the question was around sort of federal, you know, ESSER funds, but I did want to make sure that we all kind of have a note of caution around, you know, the the, the notion that Ed is, you know, giving a blanket extension of ESSER funds because that's not uh, the policy and is definitely not the practice. But um, Austin was speaking some to some of the state uh, investments that have been sort of earmarked around um, activities that were begun under ESSER. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say kind of on the state fund front, Austin. Yeah, we have seen some states that are dedicating funding in their state budgets for some of the ESSER funded activities, both to kind of braid uh, those funds with existing ESSER funds and then to provide a little bit of a, a, a home for those investments after ESSER. Um, California is a great example of this because they have this large scale expanded, I think it's expanded learning opportunities grant program and have put a lot of state dollars behind that. Um, so I, I'm hoping, Stephen, that that's getting to your question, but there, um, you know, there are some uh, cases where there might be additional funding available, non-ESSER funding available for those specific programs um, after September 2024. Yeah, I also wasn't sure if that question, um, Stephen, I can't remember if you were in our session on Wednesday, but when uh, Betty uh, from uh, Education Resource Strategy, she talked about this idea of using like carryover, like a carryover policy. Um, some states allow their LEAs to carry forward state and local funds. And so instead of this like cliff, we can look more at like a staircase where they can prioritize spending down their ESSER dollars but carry forward state and local dollars that they may have otherwise spent. And so they have a little bit longer runway. I think one thing to think about as states um, are, you know, states and districts are trying to figure this out is that district budgets are pretty inflated right now, right? They're pretty inflated. Um, and we are hearing across the country about budget deficits you know, in different districts. Just yesterday, I read about the projected deficit in Chicago Public Schools. They're talking about a $400 million deficit. Um, and I do think that as we think about sustainability, we need to also be thinking about what districts are experiencing. Like right now, the deadline may be in September, but districts have already, even this current school year, had to make decisions about like, what do we keep um, and what what do we have to let go? So this is a, an urgent right uh, conversation. And if you are an advocate or you're within your uh, within the system, I think thinking about how you might um, use what's been shared today to like focus and center the conversations in your state could be really important. Um, we do have another question, uh, so I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, this is Reggie Nash. Um, he works with us here um, in EdTrust. And so his question is, uh, I support work with partners in Kentucky, and I recently learned about the Kentucky Department of Education's Equity Playbook and very intentional work around diversity and equity initiatives and belonging. I've heard that this critical statewide uh, of work is largely funded and coordinated by COVID relief dollars, and there's a fear it will expire and the work will end. What creative solutions would you suggest for sustaining statewide efforts that prioritize equity and belonging like this? That's a great question. I'll speak to the federal kind of piece to that, but this really is the kind of lens that CCSSO is applying, you know, that looking at the uh, potential to, uh, you know, pick up these costs with federal education grants. And so, I mean, we're not going to see the amount of discretionary state money that we saw under 
the three COVID relief bills, but you know, states do reserve um, administrative money from Title I, Title II, really every federal formula grant. So you know, there may be an opportunity to pick up some of the state level effort by kind of re-examining how um, those funds are being used. But you know, again, as we kind of presented on, you know, there is broad allowability with sort of within conditions for Title I. And um, so is there potentially an opportunity for districts to re-examine their current uses of Title I and to sort of align them to these needs? Um, but really, and, and uh, the point here that the, the, the urgency of this issue, because you know, September 24 is going to roll around pretty quickly. Um, the need to actually um, sort of realign the funds would be in the budget period that's going to start, you know, next spring. So really the conversations need to happen now in order to present the kind of systemic uh, change that we're going to need. Um, but we also have seen, and Austin has spoken to, you know, state funds and potential for philanthropic support. So I don't know, Austin, anything I missed here, feel free to add. No, that was great. I don't have anything else to add, Peter. Okay. Um, I know we're coming up on time. Are there any other questions or comments, reflections that folks have um, for CCSO, SSO? I'm not a teacher, but people who are, they're always like, I'm going to, you know, wait, be quiet. But um, if there are no other questions, uh, I just want to really thank Austin and Peter for walking us through um, everything that CCSS, CCSSO is doing and informing us. Um, this is like really timely and important information. And we super appreciate you being here. We have shared some of the resources that they presented on today in the chat. We will also make sure we follow up um, with the PowerPoint from today, as well as those additional resources. So Austin and Peter, thank you both so much. All right, um, so we are going to head into our next session. Um, we are, let me share my screen really quickly. Okay. So up next, we are going to be discussing braiding and blending federal funds, um, something that uh, Austin and Peter introduced to us in their session to um, as a means to sustaining ESSER programs that work for students. And we are joined by Beth Howard Brown. Uh, she oversees um, American Institutes for Research work with the Wyoming Department of Education and Mental and Emotional Wellbeing, uh, which aligns with their multi-tiered system of support and family engagement efforts. Additionally, she works with the Region 9 Comprehensive Center to support Illinois with braiding and blending fund, funding uh, supports for districts and the Region 12 Comprehensive Center to assist state education agencies and local school districts with diversifying the educator workforce. Um, so I'm going to pull her presentation up. Okay, Beth, I believe you are on here. Um, feel free to get started. Thank you for the introduction. I am here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And welcome, welcome, welcome. And 
Thank you for joining me to discuss this great work that took place in Illinois, excited about the braided and blended efforts they have um, started. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So some of you may not be familiar. I want to give some background on the Region 9 Comprehensive Center. This center is operated by the American Institutes for Research, AIR, and it's possible through a U.S. Department of Education grant that we've had since October 2019. And it actually provides intensive capacity building services to state education agencies and other education stakeholders in Illinois and Iowa. If we can go to the next slide. So with the Region 9 Comprehensive Center, it is part of a larger comprehensive center network, which is made up of 19 regional centers and a national center. And again, it's tasked with providing capacity building services to states, districts, and schools to improve educational outcomes and instructional quality for all students. If we can go to the next slide, here's our agenda for today. I think I've made you feel welcomed and told you about the Region 9 Comprehensive Center. Now I'm going to talk with you about the Illinois braiding and blending process and the guide we created, and then provide some other resources that you can take back with you from Region 9 and AIR, and then talk about what's next for the Illinois braiding and blending guide and do some Q&A, okay? If we can move to the next slide. So the why and the who. And I kind of shared some of that already. So back in 2021, the Illinois State Board of Ed, or ISBE, wanted to provide a support system in which district leaders can have peer-to-peer -peer conversations amid the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly around how to effectively use ESSER funds and the large carryover of title dollars. As a result of this newly created community of practice, ISBE saw the need to create a braided and blending guide, which I'm gonna share with you today. Next slide, please. So what is braiding? And I think you got a taste of this a little bit already from what I came in on when CCSSO was sharing. Braided funding pools, multiple, um, but excuse me, braided funding pools, multiple funding streams. When you look at braiding, you're talking about multiple funding streams toward one purpose while separately tracking and reporting on each source of funding. So here you see the, the picture here. So it's about braiding, multiple funding streams, one purpose while separately tracking and reporting each source of funding. So on the next slide, you'll see an actual graphic there you go. Thank you so much. Here, you'll see where a student, the district or state, excuse me, the district or school has identified as eligible for funding streams A and C, seen here, meaning that they can receive services one, two, and three based on those funding streams. Once the services are delivered, the district or school staff build the funding streams accordingly and complete all necessary reporting for each funding stream. If we can go to the next slide, please. So what is blending? And let me um, share this disclaimer. Illinois does not allow blending. So there are some states that don't allow blending. So please check up and see what your state allows. And the same with the braiding. But, but with blending, as I was getting ready to share, with blending, it's like the smoothie here. Blended funding combines or co-mingles multiple funding streams for one purpose without continuing to differentiate or track individual sources. So it's that whole, their individual identities are lost with blending of funds. If we can go to the next slide, please. So here's the braiding and blending guide, as I was sharing with you that we developed for the Illinois State Board of Ed. And please know that in this guide, and you'll have access to it, I will share that link um, in the chat. It actually begins with an overview of the COP that the Illinois State Board of Ed and the Region 9 Comprehensive Center conducted to support local districts in braiding and 
lending federal funds. It also gives you some background information. And then there's another section that actually provides the steps for braiding and blending. And there is a tool which is really the heart of the actual guide. And that tool has some great questions that districts can ask themselves as they work about work through braiding and blending the funds. And then there's another section that actually address the excuse me, addresses reporting. And the final section is a series of appendices that includes Illinois guidelines, some scenarios, examples from the Illinois State Board of Education, as well as their districts and braiding and blending, and then other resources that can inform those efforts. If we can go to the next slide. Here, we have the Danville example. So with Danville, and this is an actual district that was involved in the COP, Danville actually wanted to look at those activities to support kids that were um, recovering from learning loss. So they wanted to look at developing after-school tutoring and extended learning opportunities. They wanted to use district staff, community agencies, and retired teachers to support students in grades pre-K through 12 for three years. So these activities were part of their three-year plan to address the learning gap from COVID-19. And they actually braided their funds. If we can go to the next slide, you'll actually see the funds that they actually braided here that I've listed out. So with those funds, they actually use their Title I, Part A, Improving Basic Program Funds. They use their Special Education District Funds their Title I Part A um, <clears throat> school, excuse me, school improvement funds also, their ESSER funds, their state and after-school program grant funds, and then they also use some ARP homeless children and youth funding from McKinney-Vento um, that they actually had. So they actually braided each of these. And we remember, behind the scenes, you have to look at the reporting for these funds because you braided them. So they've kept their identity, but they're still able to provide the services for the students. If we can go to the next slide. I just really wanted to throw this slide in here because I wanted you to understand just the, the beauty of the COP. It was, an, it was an actual opportunity for districts to learn about braiding and blending funds, but the districts were also empowered. They were able to collaborate with other districts to increase their knowledge and understanding of how to braid and blend federal funds. And then it was just trying to understand the power behind just the ability to mitigate common challenges that may arise when they braid and blend. And then also just those tools and resources they got. And please know that these tools and resources can help you as you um, enter into conversations with the partners and collaborators that you work with. And you're welcome to share all of these resources with them. If we can go to the next slide. So this was one of the other states that we actually worked with, Iowa, to um, look at effective use and sustainability. I heard folks talking about sustainability of their ESSER funds, and they developed a community of practice also. And if you click on that um, QR code there, that'll open up and you can read about, you just scroll down that page and you can read about just the work that's taking place in Iowa and some of our other work. If you can go to the next slide. So this is another, um, a, I want to give a lot of resources to you. So this is an opportunity that ARR has been leading um, with the U.S. Department of Ed. It's a research on education strategies to advance recovery and turnaround. It's a restart network. So trying to look at supports we can provide to um, districts, states, and schools in the space of COVID recovery. And if you can go to the next slide you'll see the various states that we're working with and just the various programs there that have been identified. But the big thing about the Restart Network is that it was it's working with pre-K through 12, again, public school systems in their recovery efforts. And it actually has um, supported them through the use of convenings, um, you'll also see various trainings that we have actually conducted with them as well. If you can go to the next slide. 
So these are some of the key activities from the Restart Network. Okay, thank you for dropping. I see the people are dropping the codes in the chat. Greatly appreciate it. Um, they actually work to build consensus through the convenings and working groups that the, that actually address the challenges to, to conducting research in a pandemic context. It actually also empowers research teams to build studies that align with the needs that are in the field as they work to coordinate with policymakers, leaders, educators, and others. And it also engages early career researchers through these various trainings. And I will share that link in the chat also. So here's some of the resources um, from the Restart Network, free resources to you. You can click on the QR code there and you will actually go to that site. Um, they have developed a couple of briefs that may be of interest to you around the ESSER set aside and then what has taken place in North Carolina. That's a brief directly focused on North Carolina and how they use their emergency funding. And you can also sign up for their newsletter. And then you will also see a link to some restart network events that may be of interest to you as well. If you can go, thank you so much. What's next? So one of the great things about this work is that the Illinois State Department of Ed um, has asked, um, State Board of Education has asked us to look at revising the guide to include an equity component. So excited about that. And then we've actually reached out to those districts that have used the guide to determine usefulness of that actual guide. And then we've shared these efforts um, with others in other states that are using the guide and trying to teach folks to braid and blend. If you can go to the next slide. Any questions? Hi, Beth. I'm wondering if you could talk through some of the key questions that you mentioned are in the tool for blading, braiding and blending. Um, yeah, so if you could dive into some specifics there. Yes, yes. And I will drop the link. I don't know if I'm not seeing the chat all the way. Let me drop the link to the guide. in the chat for you. Let me know if you can get that out of the chat. And yep. you can actually, go ahead, it worked for you? Wonderful, wonderful. So in the guide itself, like I was sharing with you earlier, there is a template that is in there. And in that template, those we've infused those questions in there for each component as folks go through their um, trying to work to, um, to develop their plan to braid and blend. So with those questions, you see related to the comprehensive needs assessment first that they would conduct. So, you know, who are, who are our partners? Who are we trying to make sure that we're supporting in these um, this plan or this effort that we're trying to actually put in place? Um, what are some of the trends? If it's certain, certainly focused, everything is focused on students, but what are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as it relates to student behaviors? Um, what is the class sizes? Um, how many students would we serve? So that's in that needs assessment component. Um, with that second component are the resources, reflection on the resources that we would need. So with that, you know, what are those resources? Um, what state and federal funds are eligible to braid or blend for the initiative? What's the intent of the federal program if we've identified federal funds? Um, what funding programs and the shared outcomes that have might have taken place? What are some of the restrictions? Those are just some of the questions, but if you go into the guide, you'll see a full list for each one. And then with that next section, you will see an actual, um, what that implementing, monitoring, and modification of that plan could look like. Um, does the plan address the resource deficiencies? Um, does your plan target educator supports? Um, what do we need to think about as it relates to accountability? 
And then what about the implementation that actually takes place? And then the last component with the reporting, a lot of um, thoughts there, you know, what are the reporting requirements that will need to be considered or taken into consideration as we go about this piece? So those are some of the questions. I didn't give you all of them, but please dig into the guide and you get a chance to um, look at all of those listed out. Um, I see, Is I can read that in the chat. What are some of the top ways you've seen districts braid or blend funds? Are there trends? Um, the biggest one has been in supports for students. It's very much like the Danville example I shared with you, um, looking at after school um, extended day programs or um, weekend support programs and um, as well as training for teachers. Those have been the big pieces. Um, that's been primarily it for the districts that we've worked with during the COP. Some of them actually funded um, positions, but they tried to make sure that those positions were about serving students and making sure that those funding streams actually aligned with the children that were being served. Thank you, uh, Beth. I'm also really curious if the COVID context is changing anything about the like ease or difficulty that districts are facing um, in braiding and blending, or is this just like business as usual? Well, keep in mind that braiding and blending was around before COVID. I just think um, as what happened that the Illinois State Board of Ed, their whole thing was folks have these masses of ma massive amount of dollars and they're trying to make sure that they're utilizing them, but also trying to think about sustainability by braiding those title dollars along with their emergency rescue plan funds as um, CCSSO was sharing earlier. And they were just trying to help them not have that because it's just going to everybody's kind of hitting that cliff. And I don't know. Um, I will also share with you um, the Edgenomics Lab has been doing some work in this space also for a number of years during this time. But um, I don't see braiding and blending going away. But I'm just concerned that folks have just are possibly allowing a, a lot of funds to just go back. Um, and just not use them because they can't spend them all and they can't figure out the best solution to spend it. Um, thinking that with the brain and blending, they can kind of use those other title and federal and state dollars that they have to kind of undergird some of those ESSER support dollars so that it's able to have some sustainability. So it just all just programs don't, and I saw the, um, Kentucky example. So a program like that won't go away. So I'm hoping that Kentucky did use some of it um, through other funding streams to help support that. I feel like I have a ton of questions and I want to allow other people to ask. Um, so if folks do have questions, feel free to come off mute, drop them in the chat. Um, while folks are still thinking. Another question that I have, you talked a lot about um, the reporting and you know the differences between what reporting looks like for braiding and what reporting looks like for blending. I'm wondering if you could talk through um, the community of practice space and how that was sort of addressed, um, you know, or discussed and like, what did districts do to better be able to navigate those complex reporting requirements? Um, even in the previous session, uh, Peter flagged that these things are really uh, complex and 
they're, you know, reporting is required at so many different levels. And so I'm wondering, like, either with the Danville example, I don't, I don't know if they were part of the community of practice or any other districts that were in that, that you want to highlight. I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, and good question. With the reporting, I think one of the great things about this work was that ISB identified actual um, consultants that from the Illinois State Board of Education to work with districts. So if they had questions about the whole resource allocation piece, they kind of helped them manage that. And that was powerful there. Um, but Illinois has a grant periodic um, performance report um, that they allow districts to actually um, you know, have transparency as it relates to um, accountability. And they make sure that with that um, grant accountability and transparency piece that they review those performance reports and discuss them. And this was actually part of conversations in the community of practice. So we had the um, ISB finance folks come in and talk with the districts about the reporting. And they made sure that they kept in mind um, their annual reports, because um, WIS ISB has a actual um, web application, if I'm remembering correctly, and um, it's a secure portal that's provided by the department. And they actually walk them through how to use that. Um, and keep in mind that they also um, looked at, um, and, and uh, I want to say, is it, it was IYs, and I may get that wrong, so please forgive me for that, blame the head, not the heart. Um, and they tried to make sure that they had those separate accounts are maintained for each of the grants that they were looking at, um, actually walking them through, um, making sure their federal funds were spent um, correctly, um, helping them with financial records so that they had the detail. So they did a lot of support in that reporting space, which was very um, beneficial to the districts and um, that they were working with. Thank you. Um, folks, uh, have additional questions or are any of the participants on, are you seeing, um, you know, the, the use of braiding and blending in your states and districts? What, what does that look like on your end? while we wait for folks to gather additional thoughts. Beth, um, and I'm sorry if you you touched on this and it was missed. What does um, reporting look like when, like uh, budgeting reporting look like when a district is doing this? Um, what are some telltale signs for folks to look for? Um, trying to make sure first and foremost, are they, providing the services that actually, first of all, are they, they have the eligible students that they identified and making sure that the services align with the supports that are allowed to be provided to those um, students, trying to also make sure that they report on those, the various funds that they use, and then also trying to make sure that they, if they're braiding, that they continue to keep those um those funding streams separate because there is not a blended situation that is separate. I'm trying to make sure the right reports have been um, submitted, that the financial records are um, kept up to date and making sure that they maintain any documentation that's required um, with the reporting as well. Um, and then if they're ever in doubt, they can always has, um, reach out to their state their state finance folks, as well as their district level folks, because they do have that background knowledge. I think the biggest thing is trying to make sure that they are compliant, um, that they're making sure that they keep those accounts that are separate, that they're, they, and it's that, that it's documented correctly.
Hey Beth, I have a question for you. For those of us who work at the at the federal level, all of this is sounds very complicated. I'm just sort of curious, are do you have any sort of like recommendations that we could maybe pass on to the Congress or to the federal government about how we could make this process easier for everyone? That's a great question, Nicholas. Um first of all, if I would love for them to um extend the time period for the ESSER funds, but we know that's not going to happen because they've done some extensions already. I think the biggest thing is how to talk with state education agencies about how to um, make this process less cumbersome for um, districts and schools and to continue to provide supports um, for districts and schools as they kind of navigate these waters. Um, and I'm thinking about just some of the work like the Egenomics Lab has done through the Comprehensive Center Networks. They've um, done a lot of webinars in the space that have been helpful to districts, and they've done some one-on-one -on -one, um, consultation with them as well. Um, I think, but the biggest things for the Fed, if they could just take off some of the requirements, um, which can sometimes seem challenging for folks to manage um, during this time, especially when we're just trying to help kids and educators who are already um, struggling from the pandemic and trying to just support them in that space of their mental and emotional well-being. But if they can just kind of work to ease some requirements. And Austin, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that. Please weigh in. But just thinking about um, if they could work to ease some of that. Thank you, Beth. And I was uh, typing into the chat, and I think your analysis is is very accurate. And you know, most of the sort of challenges around blending and braiding are not legislative. You know, so they don't uh, come from Congress. Uh, but there is an important federal role at the U.S. Department of Education, and to some extent, like the challenges originate uh, from the Department of Education, which itself, you know, has different offices that sometimes kind of struggle to coordinate and the sort of siloing effect, um, you know, uh, is itself kind of a structural challenge. But um, we have been encouraging the U.S. Department of Education to issue non-regulatory guidance that clarifies, you know, the flexibilities that are, that are inherent in current law. You know, um, the department, this uh, department has released, for example, a resource on school climate that failed to note that you can use Title I dollars for school climate. Um, so yeah, we have definitely been kind of leveraging our relationships with the department um, and yeah, that they could uh, release guidance that says many of the things that I noted in my slides that you can use Title I for school counselors. Uh, it's powerful when CCSSO says that it's much more powerful if the Department of Education says that in a sort of formal guidance document. So uh, I think the department is you know, working with the National Comprehensive Center on an effort to sustain, uh, to sort of support states in sustainability. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, an important federal role at the department level. Thank you, Beth. No, thank you, Peter. So, you know, we're talking about federal resources as a way to sustain really important programs. And I couldn't let you leave the session without asking um, about what's what may happen in Tennessee. Um, if you've been following the conversation there, that Tennessee legislature legislators are talking about rejecting nearly $2 uh, billion in um, federal funds. And just curious, um, you know, understanding the power that federal dollars can provide to states right now in this moment as the ESSER dollars run out, what, what might be like something that we could say um, or like, support our partners um, in Tennessee and saying and demonstrating the power of those dollars in this moment. And I know we didn't talk about this before, but this is a question that, that came to mind as you were, you know, talking about the, the, the power of these federal dollars to lay on to what states are currently doing right now. Yeah. Um, I, I 
Thank you. Um, and Tennessee has done a lot of great work in the equity space for a number of years. They've kind of kind of set the the bar high because they started some of the first um, equity guidebook development pieces. Um, as it re relates to what they can do, um, I think just as Peter said, um, if the U.S. Department of Ed could come in um, with some guidance, but I also think it's them taking a look at budgets, um, them looking at their title dollars and trying to see if there are ways that they could support um, through other mechanism mechanisms. Um, also thinking about the private sector because their partnerships um, with various foundations that they may not have tapped in if, if they tapped in again, but going back to them, um, we've done a lot of foundational work um, and they've supported states in implementations of programs. Um, just maybe tapping in that private sector as another source of funding. Um, yeah, I mean, there's this, this, I'm just thinking about just alternate methods of ways yeah. that we fund. Yeah, I mean, you know, from Ed Trust perspective, we're like, don't reject these dollars. These are really critical dollars. And yeah. um, we talked about this yesterday too, that uh, now is not the time to be reducing the pot, right? Um, the data that we have on student needs, whether it be academic outcomes, whether it be mental and behavioral health outcomes, whether it be any number of things, show us that like we need the money and we need to be strategically investing the money. And so um, from our perspective, right, uh, thinking about those federal dollars as being part of the the longer arc of helping students recover um, from the pandemic and its harm. And uh, we actually, like some folks in Tennessee are, you know, already pulling data, right, around Tennessee's like existing federal funding streams. And because of the nature of federal dollars, right, those dollars are supporting, you know, rural students, um, students from low income background and other students that are like facing really steep barriers to learning and they they have the most to recover from. And so mm -hmm. we are urging folks to, you know, as you all are talking or thinking about how your state might braid or blend, um, really centering it in this equity conversation because um, there isn't going to be a one-to-one -one dollar replacement from states. Like we want to continue to encourage uh our advocates and other partners to push their states to increase more funding um, and other mechanisms. But um, in lieu of that, let's tap into what we what we already have access to and what's already available. It doesn't require us to create any new standards. And these things can specifically support the needs of uh, the students we know that need the most support. So. I just wanted to end on that note because I think um, it is important. And I think, um, you know, if Tennessee legislators have it their way and this is a direction that the state goes in, it's going to really undermine um, districts and schools' ability to support students in a way that we know they need um, support. And these programs, there are programs that are working, yeah. right? Um, yeah. As the data, that Austin and Peter presented on like there, there's data that these programs are working and we have to continue to insist that we drive more resources towards the students who have suffered the most so I want to let you close out uh Beth if there's anything else you want to say to our um, audience today feel free but otherwise thank you so much um, thank you and I saw someone had in the chat about um what can what is the role that advocates can play in supporting districts through this process? Um, one, share the resources, please. They are free. Um, that template is powerful um, and folks can actually take themselves through the process of braiding. Um, it helps them look at all the funding streams. A lot of times when we've worked with districts, they 
I had not thought about a certain pot of funds that were available to support students in the space. And that's when that that tool kind of helped them think about it. Um, we list the various um, funding um, streams in Illinois that are available to them and then the actual areas that they line up with. And folks had not even thought about that pot of funds and being able to use that to support kids. So I think the biggest thing is share the tool, look at the various federal um, programs that we have identified in those priority areas and kind of support them in the process. And if they're not sure, they can always reach out to their state Department of Education as they work through the process. And here you see our Region 9 links. Please um, sign up for our newsletter there um, on the website. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. And I will also say that Ed Trust is going to continue to talk about these things um, and, and, and support advocates um, in particular as they are figuring out what their message is. Again, the session we had on Wednesday talked about how we can connect this issue to what policymakers, right, whether they're school board members, whether they're um, other elected officials at the state level, um, how we can connect this urgent need to what they're already thinking about. And so feel free to also use a trust as a resource um, and advocacy strategy and our briefs um, that are the whole reason behind why we're doing what we're doing today also include a lot of this information. So check those out. Um, thank you so much, Beth. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to staying connected. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now going to transition to our next topic, which is identifying key budget decision makers. And we are going to have my wonderful colleague, Nicholas Munyan Penny, uh, talk about who's in charge here, right? Um, how do we know who we should be talking to about these issues, whether it's a matter of braiding and blending, whether it's a matter of like a district budget, he's going to walk us through um, an amazing tool that we have that can help us with that. Thanks, Kabila. You're welcome. Uh, so, well, thanks to everyone who joins, joining us again for the second day. We're excited to continue to talk to you about uh, sustaining ESSER funds. I think one of the things um, that's one of the, key factors in doing this advocacy work effectively is making sure that we're sort of directing our asks to the right people. Uh, education governance is really complex and there's folks at various levels of government that uh, have, have the control of different levers and they all sort of do unique things and understanding, understanding what those levers are and sort of who holds which ones uh, is really important to making sure that we don't just sort of have, sort of have the policy ideas that we want done, but sort of like who is the person that can actually get it done for us, I think is really important. Uh, and so uh, the Alliance for Resource Equity, uh, which is a partnership between Education Trust and Education Resource Strategies, which you heard from yesterday, um, really focused on helping advocates and district leaders think about uh, resource equity uh, in a holistic way. Uh, we often think about resource equity in terms of just school funding sometimes, but it's really more than that. It's more, it, it's how this, how much districts are spending, but also how much they are spending. Uh, and so it's really about sort of looking at um, this in a holistic way. Like I said, um, beyond school funding, there are 10 dimensions of resource equity within our toolkit, uh, including teaching quality and diversity, empowering rigorous content, instructional time and attention, you know, positive and inviting school climate. All these pieces work together um, to provide students with the supports and experiences that they need to be successful. Um, and this is particularly true when we're thinking about ESSER spending. Um, obviously, like districts across the country are flush with money from, um, from ESSER spending, but it's sort of like how that money is being used um, that really makes a difference for students in those, for those districts. We wanna actually see the academic recovery uh, and seeing students feel welcome and supported in their schools. It's all about sort of how we're using that money effectively. Uh, and so this toolkit sort of provides uh, advocates, like I said, and district leaders, a sort of a roadmap to follow um, on how to sort of do, 
to sort of figure out sort of where the strengths and inequities are in your system, and then identifying those priorities, and then eventually sort of figuring out who it is that we should be focusing our advocacy efforts on, which is what I'll focus on mostly today. Um, but I just want to provide you a quick overview of the full the full scope of the toolkit. Um, it's in four parts. Um, the first is really just learning about the various 10 dimensions um, through our first paper, the education combination. It talks about the framework, how each dimension works, how they're interrelated, what the sort of issue, how the top sort of issues are, sort of barriers to equity in those individual dimensions. Uh, and then there's a diagnostic tool, uh, which allows uh, districts and advocates to actually dig into both quantitative and qualitative data around what's happening in your system. So you can identify both the strengths of your systems, as well as sort of what are the, where are sort of the, the areas for growth, the areas of inequities that need to be addressed in your system. Uh, and then using that, using that tool to sort of prioritize where, where you want to focus your time. Uh, and then there are a series of 10 guidebooks, one for each dimension, um, that really allow you to sort of dig in um, on sort of what are maybe the root causes of the inequities that you're seeing in your system. So particularly focusing in on the guidebooks that um, are high priority for addressing inequities in the system and then sort of figuring out we suggest some root causes in the guidebooks as well as within each root cause, thinking about sort of what are potential solutions that the district, what district leader could take um, to address these issues. Um, but we know that district leaders are not the only ones that are involved in sort of making sure that students uh, and schools have the resources that they need in each of these dimensions. Uh, and so that's why we've created this last piece of the toolkit that I'm gonna talk mostly about today, which is identifying who those decision makers are that we wanna target our advocacy efforts towards. Um, sometimes it's district, district leaders, but sometimes it might be state leaders, sometimes it might be school leaders, sometimes it might be even some federal advocacy that needs to happen. So understanding how all those pieces work together um, is really important. And so that brings us to the Advocating Across Government Guides, which is a, uh, it's a series of 10 uh, documents plus a user's guide um, that allow you to sort of dig in and sort of see who is the per who are the people, who are the sort of the levels of government, um, who are in charge of each piece of this. Um, and so figuring out sort of like who those players are um, so you can direct your advocacy to see towards them. Um, and I would say that this is really sort of the starting point sort of getting sort of a sense of, sort of who are the types of people you should be talking to. Um, but it's really important to be considering your local context, who are the specific people who are in those roles. Um, having that specific knowledge of the players in your system is going to be really key to sort of making, uh, sort of bringing this, this guide to life. Um, and um, Wailea and uh, Quibula are going to really dig into this in the next session, sort of talking about sort of like what, what this looks like in practice in your, in your context. And so when using this tool, um, the, as with some of the other tools in, in the toolkit, there's a lot of information in each of these documents. So trying to just sort of like read through them casually um, to sort of get a sense of each of the dimensions is typically not sort of the best approach. Uh, we suggest really coming to the, this tool with a specific question in mind, a specific action in mind that you're trying to get something you're supposed to, you wanna get done. Um, and then sort of framing on sort of like, who can help me get this specific thing done? Um, and once you've identified that question, um, you can think about sort of which dimension of equity is most aligned to the question that I wanna get asked, sort of the sort of the issues that I'm trying to address. Today, we're gonna focus specifically on the first dimension around school funding. Uh, and then once you sort of identified that specific guide, you'll go to that one, find references to sort of the key terms in your question. And then based on that, come up with sort of an action plan. And it could involve uh, talk, thinking about multiple levels of governance at once. Uh, and so we'll provide, I'll provide some examples. And then in a second, we'll have, after that, we'll give you some time to actually dig into these tools yourself and sort of see how they work. So here's the first example. Um, so again, we're starting with a question sort of like who can help us? So in this case, we're gonna look at sort of who can advocates engage to ensure sustaining funding for ESSER funded programs is targeted to the students most in need? Um, so I think in particular there, it's thinking about the targeting the students that are most, who are most in need is sort of the key piece. Uh, and like I mentioned, we're gonna focus specifically on the dimension of school funding today. Uh, and so once you sort of have that in mind, you can consult the guide. Um, you can hit the next button, Corbila. 
So when we look at the guide uh, for school funding, there's a few things that pop up when, it's, when we're thinking about targeting funding to specific students. So at the state level, um, legislators can dedicate funding to specific groups of students. We also know that state departments of education um, can issue guidance on sort of how to use these funds and particularly how to target them. Um, district leaders decide sort of how to allocate funds to schools within their districts. Um, and then school leaders can decide sort of how to allocate funding to staff and programming. Um, so based on that information that we've gathered from the Advocating Across Government Guide, we can then determine the appropriate action steps. So what I would suggest, um, you can go ahead and click again, Kubila, is that you probably wanna connect with district leaders here to sort of ensure that um, whatever limited funding we have is going to the schools uh, sort of with the largest populations of students with high needs, really making sure that we're targeting those dollars to the highest needs schools in your district. If you're in a smaller district um, where there's sort of less shuffling funds between schools, then maybe it's sort of the school leaders that you talk to to make sure that those funding, that those funds are getting directed to the students who need them most. And that sort of the programs themselves are sort of targeting students with the highest need for access to those programs. Um, but when we're thinking about the funding specifically, district leaders are pretty, a pretty good spot to, to go for this. So the, we'll look at the next example. Um, so let's think about it in a different way. So in this case, we really want to engage, we want to think about, so who can advocates engage to ensure that new funding is allocated to limit cuts to SESSER programs? This is something that we talked a lot about earlier today, as well on Wednesday, as well as on Wednesday. Um, really, we want to be thinking about how can we potentially be increasing revenue for school systems so that we can make up for the shortfall that's coming from the end of ESSER spending. So again, we're going to be looking at dimension one, um, school funding, um, to sort of figure out how we can sort of be focusing on this new funding situation. So when we look there, go ahead and click again. Um, we can see that state education, state legislators set, can help set education budgets themselves. Um, for the full state uh, and sort of dedicate funding uh, at the state level. Um, local governments can set and ask, can also ask voters to raise taxes for additional school revenue. Uh, and then school boards are the ones that we sort of decide um, how to prioritize um, spending priorities and sort of set the school budget themselves with supports from school leaders. So that's sort of, those are the key places where we see revenue being raised, particularly uh, the state legislature and local governments. So based on that, um, go ahead and click again, Quibula. Um, We really want to be connecting with uh, either state legislators or local government official, officials, such as city council members, um, to really focus, if we're really focusing on the raising revenue piece, rather than in the last example, we were focusing on targeting funds, we were talking to, to district and school leaders. So for this particular ask, we're thinking about something different. Uh, you may also want to talk to school board members uh, as they can sort of influence what actually goes in um, to the district budget itself. And so now that we've done a couple of examples, uh, I've talked through a couple of examples, I want you all on the call to be able to spend some time digging into the resource itself. So uh, I'm gonna go over the question uh, and then I'm gonna give you one to two minutes to sort of look through the guide to see if we can find references to what folks at different levels of government could be doing to address this issue. Uh, and then I'll ask you all at once to sort of put all of your answers in the chat at the same time. That way everyone has a chance to actually um, dig through before people give answers. So the first question, the question here we're gonna look at together is who can advocates engage to ensure funding for impactful asset programs are sustained at current levels? Um, so really thinking about sort of how can we make sure that um, budgets, budgets are continuing to include um, the line items for the things that we care about are impactful that have been impactful using ESSER money, maybe coming from a different fund. So again, we're of course continuing to use the Dimension One tool here. Um, so if you haven't already, click into it and then take a few minutes to sort of look through the guide and see if you can think about sort of who should we be talking to to make sure that um, our, our school system budgets are continuing to have um, money for, uh, for the programs that we think are impactful.
So feel free to start drafting your answers in the chat, but wait until I say to send. All right, finish up typing your answers now. Give you about 10 more seconds. Okay, everyone, go ahead and hit send on your answers. Where, what are some examples of uh, where in the, the guide we see examples of how this could work, how we could be addressing, um, sustaining our programs at the current levels? Go ahead and send your answers. Do folks need another minute? It's okay if that's true. within the district section for local school boards, administrators, as well as the school, a school level among school leaders. Thanks, Emily. Multiple levels, both the state and local levels have a hand in sustaining funding priorities. Yes, absolutely. Um, Kubila, can you go ahead and click to the, through the slide a little bit? So I had similar things to what you all said. Um, state legislators can set education budgets, school boards decide how to prioritize spending, um, and set the budget school budget with support from district leaders. School leaders are allocating funding for programs, and then parent boards um, can advise school leaders, particularly around the use of funds for programs. So based on that, go ahead and click again, Kabila. Um, we're saying that advocates should consider connecting with school board members since they're the sort of the people that are prior that decide overall budgets and including sort of like what to prioritize in the budget. So as we're thinking about very many competing priorities within school budgets, those are the folks that we want to be talking to um, to make sure that we're um, getting the programs that we think are most impactful um, to be prioritized in the next school budget, um, particularly as money is short, uh, as well as. And we also think that talking to school leaders and parent boards, they can also be engaged to help prioritize this and sort of provide sort of extra avenues for pressure on the school board. All right, we'll do one more example. Nicholas, is it time for questions or no? Because I had one on you. You can ask the question now. There, I was going to do it after the next example, but feel free to ask now. Yeah, so um, I know in my answer for like school board, I was like school board, but specifically like budget folks. Um, I was just curious if you had um, more like specificity about school boards or do you think that like everybody, anybody on the school board um, is someone worth like talking to as an advocacy strategy? Yeah, I think that's really where it comes, where your local, your knowledge of your local context comes into play. Understanding sort of who are the people who are on the school board that might be most engaged in the budget process? Uh, maybe the people you that you wanna focus your advocacy efforts towards, or maybe those who you have the strongest relationship with, uh, or those who maybe are the most influential on the board, maybe sort of the folks that you talk to. Uh, but like I said, this the advocating across government tool really is a sort of like the starting point, And then you sort of need to take into consideration sort of your knowledge of the local players to sort of bring this to the next level. Does that answer your question, Kabila? Yes, thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next slide for you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so our next our next question to practice together. 
um, goes back to our theme of today, which is about around braiding and blending funds. Who can advocates be engaging to ensure that your school system is leveraging existing state and federal funds to sustain ESSER programs? Um, so really remember sort of looking at sort of leveraging state and federal funds to sustain things that are happening at our, at our district level. Um, so now take another minute, dig back into the, the advocating across government guide uh, and prep your answers. I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to dig through again. It'll take about 30 more seconds. All right, take your last five seconds here to finalize your answers in the chat. Okay, go ahead and hit send. Tell me what you got. Federal representatives, school boards and local administration. Absolutely, anybody else have? Think they have an idea of who we could be engaging based on this tool? School boards, district leaders, local school boards, yes, parent and boards, totally. Reaching out to state level, federal officials potentially, yes, absolutely. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some what I said very similar things. Um, the thing that I added that I didn't see really in the chat was that the both the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education, and State Departments of Education um, often issue guidance on how this can, how we could best be doing this work well, sort of leveraging the state and federal system funds to sort of sustain our programming. So I think the the sort of based on this, you can go ahead and click again, Fabula. Um, so you're all right. Sort of talking to school boards, talking to districts and school leaders are sort of the right people to be talking to around the, uh, how we allocate the funds. Um, but uh, something that I would consider based on sort of what we see here and sort of who can do what, it might be it might be wise for advocates to actually, um, uh, absolutely, select all of the apply is often the case. This is sort of figuring out sort of like who are the people that we should talk to and maybe in what order as well. So I think it makes sense in this case to sort of consult with DOE officials and guidance around sort of how this can be done and then taking that information that we've gained or also potentially using the great resources that uh, CCSSO and Beth provided, um, using that information and then taking that to the folks at the local level, school board members, district leaders, um, to help them um, think about how they can be doing this work. Very right, awesome. So those are just a couple examples of how this is working. Um, I just wanted to sort of bring us back and remind us that sort of Securing funding is just one piece of the puzzle uh, of making sure that we're providing the supports for all students that they need. Um, and then we really want to be thinking about um, beyond the funding, um, what uh, what things, what other parts of this toolkit we should be thinking about in terms of making sure that we're meeting students' needs um, beyond ESSER. So for instance, if you're looking to um, make sure that your targeted intensive tutoring program is working effectively, um, you may want to be looking at the dimensions of instructional time and attention to be thinking about sort of the timing of the timing of tutoring, um, the size of the groups, 
um, teaching quality and diversity dimension to think about sort of how we're thinking about recruiting and retaining tutors themselves, and also the empowering rigorous content dimension, which really focuses on cur the curriculum that students are engaging with. Um, so as we're thinking about sustaining sustaining these programs and making sure that they're impactful for students, um, funding, like I said, is really important, but we also wanna make sure that we are um, considering sort of the full scope of the things that students need um, to be successful and what district leaders can be doing um, with, the, with the support of advocates to really make sure that we're meeting students' needs. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to folks for any additional questions um, on, this, on this particular tool, on the ARE tool in general. I'm happy to sort of um, engage with any of those things. And I'll also, I'll also give a plug for the, the user's guide, which is a part of this tool, this sort of tools um, grouping. There's some other specific examples other than the ones that I gave that touch on some of the other dimensions that can sort of show you how um, this sort of like four step process can be applied to other dimensions too. And you, in, those, in those dimensions, you often see sort of um, less of the select all that applies um, than, you did in this, than you did in this dimension. Thanks, Jordan. Seeing no questions, um, I will pass it, I believe, to Jordan to introduce our next session. I'm sorry, I was slow to come off mute. Oh, no, no problem. I did have a question. Um, so let's say, for example, like for someone who's in like a business development role um, that is cultivating a lot of relationships with states and districts, is there a particular um, first point of entry that you would recommend um, if, let's say, they were trying to learn more about that district's priorities and plans to see where they might need support for some of their services to spend some of the ESSER funds? Like, what would you recommend as a point of entry for someone in that sort of a role? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I my sense would be that talking to sort of either folks from uh, like the superintendent or maybe even folks at the school board would probably be the best sense to get a sense of uh, the priorities in that school system. Um, those would be sort of the folks that I would that I would recommend talking to. Thank you. Yeah. I'd also add um, that in, oop, y'all can't see me, sorry. <laughs> I'd also add that in um, some states, like if you are already not uh, plugged in, some states um, have like very um, intentional, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like some states uh, have businesses like who have decided we have a stake, right? In education and they have developed their own institutions, organizations to insert um, themselves in the like collaboration and thinking about how to improve um, education. Because at the end of the day, Students are going to school to learn, to grow, but they also are hope, hopefully going to be the next workers of the future, right? They're going to be um, the engineers and future educators and uh, everything else. Um, yes, like Nicholas just put in the chat, local chambers of commerce could be also good, um, uh, a good place to also start and target um districts um, because, you know, the priorities uh, could be aligned um, with the business sector's uh, priorities as well. So I've been inspired. Um, I know like Massachusetts, I'm not remembering the name of the institution in Massachusetts, but they've been, um, their like business education organization has been really active um, and engaging on education. Uh, Best NC in North Carolina, they are like a business uh, collective and they 
um, really focus on educate educators and like educator compensation and making, you know, the educator pathway something that can, re- you know, attract and retain um, teachers in the state. And so I think looking for those sort of partnerships is also a great way um, to tap in. Yeah, I think that's absolutely cool. I just want, to, just want to sort of underscore that the this tool in particular focuses on sort of like who it is like within the government that can be that we should be targeting our advocacy towards, but folks that we may want to engage as partners um, likely could fall outside of sort of that scope of folks that we want to be engaging. So like local chambers, local other community organizations that are doing are, are doing similar advocacy are good folks to be engaging with as well, uh, particularly as they might have um, really good knowledge of what's happening in your system in your particular system. Nicholas, if folks um, want help like power mapping or even just identifying the people in their states and districts, um, are they able to reach out to you? Um, Yeah. Yeah, they can reach out to me. They can reach out to Reggie. Either of us would be great. We're great resources. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you, Nicholas, um, and uh, we're going to let Jordan take us away. I'm going to share my screen for the next session. Yeah, thank you. So I think we've heard a lot about these discussions kind of in theory. What does this look like and how can advocates engage? Um, We know many of you are on the ground and doing this work or engaging in these communities already. So we really want to focus this um, section around making the case for sustainability um, and how to lobby and engage um, your decision makers and your states and districts directly. Um, So we've got Wailea Chase and Quavila Edelston here. And um, we are just going to focus this session really on digging into what this has looked like and strategies that have worked for folks who have engaged deeply in the budgeting process um, around ESSER. Um, But we also know many of you have done this. So if you've got tips or um, scenarios that you've seen play out, please share them in the chat or come off mute when we get to the to the Q&A section as well. Um, Because I think the the strongest way to find success in this space is to really learn from and engage with other folks who are um, who are engaging in this similar work. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Wailea if you can come on screen. She's on here. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just, you, okay. I'm not seeing you. That's my bad. <laughs> um, so let's just start. Um, would love uh, just for you and Quibila both to give us um, an overview. Just tell us about yourselves, the work that you're doing, Um and the organization that you um, engage with or work for in this space. Quabila, if you could, obviously you're in this current role, but could you give um, folks a background on what your role was before coming into Ed Trust, where you you were doing this at a more local level? So we'll start with Wailea. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. So my name is Wailea Chase. I'm the Director of Operations and Community Engagement for the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence, um, also known as the BBC, um, to break it down a little bit smaller. Um, I'm literally sitting here looking at my own um, title to make sure I got it right. Ridiculous. Uh, And so um, I started out with the Black and Brown Coalition from its inception as a volunteer. Um, I do lots of volunteer work in this space in terms of advocating for um, for the black and brown communities in Montgomery County. Um, I'm also a racial equity facilitator. I design and facilitate racial equity trainings. Um, I started doing that uh, in my previous position uh, when, was with, when I was with Leadership Montgomery. Um, so I started with the Black and Brown Coalition as a volunteer. Um, I was an NAACP parent council rep. And so the Black and Brown Coalition was founded by the NAACP um, parent council in Montgomery County and by Identity, uh, which is a Latino serving organization. Um, And Diego Uruburu is the executive director. Byron Johns um, is the chair of the NAACP parent council. 
Uh, and so they called me one day. I was a very active and avid volunteer, and I had lots to say about you know, different things that we could do with the Black and Brown Coalition and how we could make it even better and, you know, all this stuff. And so they called me one day and said, um, I think we were, well, I've been now in this role as a paid um, person for, for a year now, a little over a year. And they called me one day and said, um, would you come on as our, you know, executive director? And I said, oh, really? And I had been thinking about this, you know, in terms of this is a kind of thing I would love to do. Um, and but I, and I was praying and I said, but God, I would really like to be paid for it. And so when Diego called me and asked me about it, I literally had to pull over to the side of the road and said, wow, watch what you pray for. Be ready for it sort of thing. So that's how I started with the Black and Brown Coalition. Um, and proud to be here. And at the Black and Brown Coalition, we advocate for educational equity for all students in Montgomery County, but Black and Brown and low income students in particular. Thank you. Ubila? Yeah, yeah um, so first of all, good to see you again, Walia. I'm excited to be part of this conversation with you. Um, so before joining the Education Trust in my current role, I worked at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, which is a local policy and advocacy uh, think and do tank um, in DC that primarily advocates to ensure that DC is a place where Black and Brown and longtime uh, Washingtonians can thrive. Um, as you all know, DC has a pretty high inequality rate on multiple fronts. And so um, at that organization, I was uh, focused on the education uh, system in DC and specifically advocating on the budget. Um, so in DC, the mayor, she has her first go at the budget and then the council gets it and there's a whole conversation and activation around the budget process. And so I really cut my teeth <laughs> on advocacy and um, targeting certain uh, decision makers and leveraging certain strategies to get what we want. Um, and so I'm super excited to share uh, some of those experiences with y'all because I really want more of us to, to step into the power that we have. Um, we all play a role, right? Like in that capacity, I was a paid advocate, but I was very intentional in being in coalition spaces with folks who are volunteers, who are family members who have children in the system. And that's what made the work uh, all worth it to me. So thank you, uh, Jordan, for giving me this platform to talk about my previous life. <laughs> thank you. And so to jump in just for context of where we're at now um, with kind of the approaching fiscal cliff, what, um, how have you, how did both of you engage with districts and state leaders on ESSER funds, you know, how have you engaged in it and are, what is it looking like now um, in this context? We'll start with Wailia. Okay, I didn't wanna just jump in. So um, the Black and Brown Coalition, we have a pretty strong um, membership uh, in terms of our active members who, um, who walk the walk, I would, I would say. And so we asked, you know, who would be a part of the Maryland um, blueprint, blueprint for Maryland's future, um, the committee, right? They were doing outreach, they were starting the blueprint and, and all this other stuff. Who would be a part of that committee and report back to us, right? And that's a volunteer role. And so um, we had two people, and one in particular is a gentleman who um, is running his own nonprofit organization. So he's full time, full speed ahead doing that, um, but volunteered. And so um, he was on the committee for the blueprint, and he would come back to our monthly meetings and report out um, and sort of lay it out in a way that that was palatable. Everyone could understand. Um, and so we started there. Um, and, you know, really got deep dives regularly into what ESSER is and isn't, right, how the funds would be allocated. Um, and then myself and some of my other colleagues now, I want to, you know, set the stage in terms of I'm the only full-time paid person, the Black and Brown Coalition. I have a part-time admin, um, but the rest of the folks are all volunteer. 
and um, all volunteer people. And so, um, you know, doing these deep dives, right? This is my paid work, but I wasn't paid before I was a volunteer. Doing these deep dives takes a lot of time and energy as everyone can imagine, right? But we had committed folks doing that, have committed folks doing that. And so, and then Ed Trust came alongside because we decided that we needed to do a two day sort of, you know, trying to get folks who are leaders in our community who are also um, aligned with our goals and our mission for the black and brown community, um, we wanted to get them in a room together in person and talk about ESSER and talk about the blueprint and really make sure that people understood what we were asking them to come alongside of us and advocate for and with. Uh, and so Ed Trust was instrumental in coming out and really um, laying that out for us uh, in a great way. And we were able to have a question and answer session. So, so this is the way, um, this is my long answer of, this is how we engage the community in a variety of different ways, but really um, drilling down on the information and making sure that we are not exhausting people with data, but um, really, and then also putting real real life situations and scenarios. What is the cost of not having this, right? Um, what is the cost of not, you know, doing this work, of not um, understanding ESSER and of not understanding this fiscal cliff and Maryland blueprint and how those all come together? And then what actionable steps can we take as advocates to really move things forward? Um, and that's played out really well um, in terms of the advocacy that we've done with our district leaders um, and state leaders as well. But with our district leaders, we literally were sitting in a room with our superintendent, Dr. McKnight, and her staff and really talking about the allocation of funds and advocating for areas that we thought the funds should be in, um, you know, that would also positively impact all students, but our Black and Brown students especially, um, because the disparities are shocking disappointing, upsetting, all those things and more. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, and I think um, the questions you posed of what is the cost of not having um, these funds and not doing this work um, is a great throwback and reminder to how to engage and message on this, like with media as well. Um, so it's a great tie back to some of Wednesday's sessions that I encourage folks to look back at. Kubila. Yeah, I'll just add, as I said, my job was really to look at the budget and understand what the mayor was first proposing and then effectively lobby the council, as well as um, the traditional public school system, DC public schools, um, to make the choices we know students need. And one of the first things that our organization did was we sought out community input, particularly when it came to the American Rescue Plan. So we created this shared Google Doc um, and asked folks, where do you think DC should be investing these dollars? And we partnered with other organizations um, that were more um, that are more direct service and actually interact with the very people that we are trying to impact. And we made sure that we um, weren't just talking to like other paid advocates and getting their ideas, but also pushing that uh, document to the ground um, where folks who are experiencing homelessness, where students and families, child care workers, all the different people um, in DC who stood to either benefit from how the city invested its dollars or be really harmed um, by the way that the city chose to prioritize the dollars, so, or the district. Um, and so we did that. And I believe we got nearly 80 different organizations um, and individuals to sign on to that letter. Um, that we were able to put together that really reflected um, a broader voice on uh, how DC could invest its uh, American Rescue Plan dollars. Thank you. Um, looking at um, connecting this with um, Nicholas's session here, right, is because all of the, the advocacy you do, right, you have to know who to direct it to and you have to build relationships um, with those decision makers. So could you both speak to how you built relationships with state and district leaders to engage them in these conversations and how you kind of maintain um, the 
the communication throughout that so you can ping them as as these issues arise and I'll let you all jump in whenever okay yeah so again DC right city state you know it has like its own complex governance structure and you know we have a state board of education but they don't have any budgetary power um and so knowing that the main targets here you know were the mayor because she writes the budget first um also the dc council chairman uh phil mendelson um Unfortunately, DC does not have a committee on education within the DC council. Um, Chairman Mendelssohn collapsed that when a former council member, David Grasso, uh, stepped down and so, or didn't run for re re-election. So the chairman really is the main target oftentimes for a lot of different education, um, budget or policy conversations. Um, so we knew that he was going to be a primary target. And so the way that we were able to effectively get to him was through his staff. Um, I know, you know, engaging with the policymakers themselves is really important, but the staff are the, the people who are really reading the, the details. And so, um, I just made uh, intentional choices to develop relationships with his staff. I made sure to know who prioritizes what. There are many, many different educational agencies in DC, and um, but not all of his staff covers every single agency. So knowing which of his staff to target specifically on this, um, on ESSER, um, and other pandemic relief funding that related to students was um, the most helpful and impactful way we were able to target our advocacy. Um, so we built relationships with, again, our school system, because who better to build a relationship with? We didn't want to have an adversary relationship. That doesn't benefit anyone. Right. We never wanted our school system to feel like it's a gotcha moment. But we were very clear also in that we're not advocating for the school system. We want to partner with the school system to better serve our students and our communities. Um, but that we were not, you know, going to not say some things, for lack of phrasing it better. Um, we weren't going to hold back on saying what needed to be said or doing what needed to be done. Um, and worry about um, offending. We did and we didn't. Um, we were clear about the relationship and Nicholas knows because Nicholas was um, on our advisory um, committee in that we came up with the term, one of our advisory committee members came up with the term and we loved it, we're critical friends. Um, with our school just district, right? Um, so we have to say the things, but we partnered in such a way that we said, you know, provide us necessary data, for instance, on how are our students really doing, right? Um, because we can we can get the data, but it would be best if we get it from them, allow them to explain and all of the stuff and talk about what can be best be done better, best, right? And and where should funds be allocated, you know, to help these things. So for example, you know, we advocated for tutoring. Right. When we saw what was happening during the pandemic, you know, things like that. And where can these dollars go? How can they best be utilized? And so we develop relationships with um, with our district leaders, um, Dr. McKnight included, um, but with also the parents and caregivers of the students that we're advocating for, because you can't say that you're advocating for any community, for anyone without inviting them to the table. Right. And making sure that what we're advocating for is actually what they want and need. Right. But the, also that they understand, you know, and show them what they don't know because we don't know what we don't know. And that's a part of, you know, one of the, the forums that we're having on November 9th on literacy. Um, but um, we built the relationships um, brick by brick. And, and, you know, just I'll end with our former superintendent, Dr. Smith is the one who actually came to Diego and to Byron and said, you know, you all are always in here at central office talking about these different issues for these communities, a lot of them sound the same. Now, a lot of them are, are, are different, but for the most part in terms of, you know, um, access to, to things, 
for our communities, for the black and brown community, were very similar. And he said, you know, I think that you all would be stronger together. And so that's how the black and brown um, organization was born. Uh, and so, you know, we've just built on those relationships. We worked hard on those relationships to, to, to sustain those relationships. And it's all about what's best for our students um, and for our demographic. And so um, we continue to thrive in that. Uh, it is work. Um, it is work, but we but we put in the work. Thank you. Um, Kubila, I know you touched on this a bit with engaging staff. Um, anything else to, to add there? Yeah, I mean, I also, as I mentioned earlier, worked um, in different capacities with volunteers. So um, there are some in DC, almost every ward has, a, has an education council or education coalition. And so, um, and then there's a single coalition that sort of every ward-based education coalition participates in. And so showing up in that space to hear about what the priorities were, what were the concerns on the ground? Because if we remember, you know, school shut down, educators were scrambling. We certainly hadn't addressed the digital divide. And a lot of what was discussed was that we are struggling to connect with our students, right? We don't have um, sustainable means to work with our students. This needs to be elevated and prioritized. And my organization has, you know, my former organization had long been um, a really um, prominent force in like budget advocacy and elevating those concerns. So we were able to provide like technical, a lot of technical support to those coalitions who were like, we don't have devices you know, that in turn looks like ex examining the budget books, um, examining like which agencies would certain funding live so we could like get immediate devices and connectivity set up for students. Um, you know, knowing the role and, and the value add of my, organ my former organization and then connecting that to the needs of the folks who are on the ground trying to do the very difficult work of teaching students in that environment. You know, can I also share as I'm listening to Kabila, um, it reminds me, you know, many times we do so much in our organizations and I'm talking about everybody on this Zoom and, you know, everybody that you've touched over the last two days. Many times we do so much we forget we because we do it. It's like, you know, if you learn to ride a bike, it's just what you do. Um, you just keep on doing it. Um, what you just said, Kabila, brings to mind that um, the Black and Brown Coalition stood up ex equity hubs during the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic. Right. Um, there were families who still had to go out and work. Right. They did not have the option to work from home. And if they did not work, they did not earn any money and then they could not feed their families. And so we had some people who did have the means to sort of have um, uh, I don't, COVID pods where they, they would have their kids together and, you know, only these families would, you know, work together and would not go outside of that pot. And so um, in my other volunteer work as a PTA president and all those other things, I had a family of means reach out to me and said, we're doing this. Um, but I know that you're with this other organization, the Black and Brown Coalition. And I'm wondering if, um, if we could help out in any way. And I said, well, it'd be great to have this kind of pod that you have, but sort of open it up to others who need a safe place for their children to be while they're learning virtually while they go out to work because they don't have the means for the childcare and you know all that other stuff. And so the equity hub, so the Black and Brown Coalition was instrumental in getting that started, right? And we started the equity hubs and we got lots of funding to um, get the lap, well, we got the laptops through ESSER, you know, from, from the school system, but to get the headphones, but to have schools to open up kindergarten classrooms because kindergarten classrooms had um, access to outside. And so open up those kindergarten classrooms and they also had their own bathrooms where different grades could have their own pods and have access to that classroom. And then licensed childcare providers were funded to provide childcare. And so those equity hubs were either $50 a month or less, depending on your income. And um, some of them provided transportation, but most of them were in a neighborhood where people could walk. 
And so those were one of the things that we did, but we did that in partnership with our district leaders. We also did that in partnership with other parents and caregivers in the community, but also with like-minded organizations who were um, who had to pivot during the during the um, height of the pandemic and you know start supplying things that they didn't normally supply during the pandemic. Thank you. So you've both touched on the importance um, of engaging community, like the direct communities and impacted communities, particularly parents and students in your advocacy work and tactics. So in that you know vein and with that frame, what tactics have proven the most um, effective in influencing decision makers um, for, you know, uh, specifically around ESSER um, and specifically around the use of budget funds for you both? Um, I'll go first. The tactics that have been um, very powerful for us have been having the parents and caregivers involved in this advocacy work, truly har harnessing that collective power and truly having them and teaching them and, and bringing them alongside advocacy for themselves and for their, for their children. And in so doing, that means we would pay close attention to Board of Education meetings and what the topics would be. Um, we would meet with Board of Education members and say, hey, you all are focusing on this, but you know, as you're talking about evidence of learning data, for instance, we would really like you to go a little deeper and ask some more questions and not take things at face value, really hold our school system accountable. And so to that end, we would you know, know what the upcoming topics were at the Board of Education, get some parents and caregivers involved, and talk to them about, you know, what do they think about the evidence of learning data that we're presenting to them? What do they think about, you know, this large number of black and brown students who are not meeting benchmark, who are not reading by the end of third grade, you know, things like that. Um, and so get their thoughts, help them put pen to paper and write their testimony in their own words. And we would ask for volunteers from them, parents and for those parents and caregivers, who among you can testify in front of the Board of Education um, using the words, your own words that we put, help you put pen to paper. Um, and so we got lots of volunteers. And so they would come out to Board of Education meetings and um, and testify, you know, but first we had to give that education on ESSER, what it means, what what is the cost of not having these funds allocated for tutoring, you know, for all of these things to lift our kids up, especially during the pandemic when the gap was exacerbated. And so they would come out and they would testify. And we had Spanish speaking parents who would testify in Spanish first, and then we would provide translation. Um, and so we would show up en masse. You know, um, a lot of times identity would provide door to door transportation, you know, renting buses and, you know, sending people in taxis and show up en masse at Board of Education meetings, especially around ESSER. Um, and, and it was all about ESSER. Um, especially during the pandemic and, you know, as we were coming out, well, not out of it, but I think you know what I mean, um, but showing up in the same color shirts, you know, so even though there may have only been four people testifying, um, holding up signs while those people were testifying. So everybody in the audience, TV viewing audience, everybody in person, all the Board of Education members, our superintendent and her staff knew that these people were here about ESSER. And so people would hold up signs saying, where's the money, you know, and in English and in Spanish. Um, and so, so those are some of the ways that that were most effective in influencing our decision makers. Media would come out, um, and we would ask our parents and caregivers to give interviews, and we would prep them for that. You know, are you comfortable? And they would, you know, some would come forward and say that they were comfortable. And so, you know, print media, all of those things, very powerful. But again, I can't stress enough the power of those parents and caregivers coming out and speaking in their own words, um, and giving them audience to people that they would not normally have audience with. It was very powerful and it, it it still is. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add that again because of the governance structure in DC, um really had to rely on multiple tactics across multiple fronts. So there was like obviously the insider baseball game that was going on knowing what particular council members cared most about and being able to answer like technical factual questions for them. And then there was more of that like narrative shaping piece of the strategy as well, right? So really tapping into, like I said, those ward-based education councils 
Um, there were also there are also or other organizations in DC that are more um, like caregiver or parent facing, and they have the skill set of mobilizing and organizing those folks. So then it's like taking what we know on the technical side and like Walia said, educating these folks about like, this is the process. This is what we know about the money. This is what we don't know. And, you know, as a caregiver or, you know, any other stakeholder um, that is, is uh, engaged, you know, layer your your imperative and your perspective onto like what we know and what we don't know. And it really did take that effective strategizing across different stakeholders with different um, access to power um, to effectively like target the mayor, the council. And I, I didn't say too much about the public school system itself um and then we also have like the public charter school system as well um but that is in large part because again uh, dc has mayoral control the mayor she like where the power <laughs> is concentrated really characterized our, our our strategies and our tactics and so um i made it my personal goal to engage on the ground because i wanted whatever we were ultimately targeting to these decision makers to reflect that, um, but also flagging for community members when were the opportunities that they could say what they wanted to say, right? Without my talking points or my organization's talking points, when could they say what they wanted to say? And so, you know, since it was my job to keep abreast of when these conversations were happening, sending emails, texts to people saying, hey, DCPS is going to be having this budget hearing or DCPS is planning on doing this with their, their money or did you see that the mayor proposed all of um, the Office of State Superintendents of Education or Aussie's um, ESSER share to go towards high impact tutoring? Well, you all are also talking about teacher well-being and student mental health and um, school safety, but these things aren't reflected in the mayor's budget. You need to get out in front and say, you know, we need to prioritize other areas for students as well. So it was very much a back and forth between like, you know, my institution, my my former job, the people that were more like volunteers on the ground, and then the people that could actually push the needle on something. Yeah, so I think, um, what with both of you touching on you know how you help educate and prepare and and support um community um members in lifting their own voices Wiley, i know we've talked before so i'm wondering if you can um speak on some of the specifics to this to this group as well on um some of how you shaped your asks and like emails with providing sample language and um for these kinds of tactics to, to your um, volunteers and, and community advocates. So could you, um, yeah, just highlight some examples of what that looked like for you? Yeah, with, so oh, for all of our advocacy points, we want to remove any barriers to participation in advocacy. And so with people as busy as they are, um, we, you know, if we're asking another organization or organizations or just individuals, you know, to carry forward our message of advocacy, um, we want to make sure um, that they understand what we're asking of them. But we want to make sure that they understand the importance of it and really what we're doing. And so if we're asking another organization or individuals to share information about what we're doing next or whatever, um, and we're doing that in email format, I will put the email together and say, hey, can you please share this with your communities and give bulleted, bullet points so that it's you know easy to digest, not big old paragraphs and say, um, here's what we're putting forward. Here's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Um, here's why now. And then I literally give them the blurb that they can then just forward, copy, paste it and forward to your listserv. And, and I give them editing privileges. I say, here's a message that you can use, copy, paste it done. You don't have to do anything else. And you can edit if you like. And, and I always get feedback that that's really helpful um, because people want to help. So 
Sometimes they just don't know how they get really, really busy, but I package it, you know, repackage it, you know, for them. Um, and again, they can edit and put it in their own words, but nine times out of 10, um, it is something that is beneficial to them. And it's not and it's not the same message, right? So I'm not gonna send this, the message to Kid Museum, you know, the same one that I'm gonna send to Arts on the Block or the same one that I'm gonna send to, you know, Jews United for Justice, right? They're gonna be different um, messages that is targeted to their population, but that ultimately benefit the black and brown students um, that we're all advocating for. Uh, and so we, we try to remove all barriers to participation for the people that we ask to advocate for us. And it's the same with the parents. Um, when we have a community forum, we are clear in that these parents and caregivers can be a million other places. They could be doing a million other things, right? And so that everybody's time is valuable and precious. And so we don't want to create a space where we're just talking at them, right? We want, we create a space where they are able to get involved and that the information that we share and that they share doesn't live and die in the space that we're in, that we are clear with them on what next steps will be and how the information that we've collected from them and the, the words that we've asked them to speak or whatever they've shared is going to move forward, where it's going to move forward and where, they're, where they can expect to see it show up, right? So we tell them that what we're talking about here today, we've done these forums in, in different schools across the county. Um, and, and I just want to back up by taking away barriers to participation means that when we ask these parents to show up at six o'clock at night till eight to 8 p.m. to 8 p.m., we provide free child care. We provide meals. Um, and in some cases, we provide transportation. Right. And so that's removing all barriers. So you can show up with your kids. There's going to be child care. There's going to be games for them to play. There's going to be someone to help them with their homework. They're going to get a meal. All you have to do is roll them on home, put them in pajamas, and you can even bring them in pajamas if you want to, because then all you got to do is roll them on home, wash your face. Don't wash your face if you don't want to. And then you're all done. But you participated and people feel good about truly doing something that is moving the needle forward for their children and that they're truly advocating. Right. And so so those are important. So we've removed barriers to participation. We know people want to help. Sometimes they don't know how. And we and we walk them through and we and we we show them the steps on, on how to do um, and make spaces for them to do. And I know I missed something in there, but that's OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time. And so I think we want to get to a, a, a brief recap um, and then open it up to questions for folks. So folks, please start thinking through questions you wanna ask um, Wailea and Quavila and um, start typing them in in the chat. Um, but I would love to um, hear after I just do a brief recap of what you covered for both of you. So if you can think through what's like one last closing tip, recommendation, you know, thought you have as folks are heading into engaging more deeply with, um, you know, how to address and sustain funds as we approach the fiscal cliff. So yeah, what's one closing, you know, thought recommendation that you want folks to leave here with um, from your perspective? And so real quick, just some recap of the tips in terms of keeping, to keep in mind when you're engaging with decision makers. District and state leaders' jobs, they are to serve their communities, students, so ultimately they work for you. So you, and highlight that with your advocates and volunteers, um, that you have a right to make recommendations, you have a right to request transparency, um, and, and, and just kind of see that um, as you approach the table. It's very important to elevate parent and student voices, um, both in meetings with decision makers, um, as well as in shaping what you bring to decision makers, come prepared, have a clear set of discussion items or asks that you are ready to um, discuss in those spaces and build those relationships with school and district um, and state leaders uh, so that you can call on them and leverage them, you know, in the long term um, as you're you know, you're engaging in this space now and you'll have other chances and needs to engage again. So really build those relationships deeply. Um, Kubil, if you could change to the next slide. Um, and so tips to keep in mind when engaging communities, make asks easy, provide samples, engage community in the development of your recommendations and plans, especially parents and students when we're working in this context. 
and connect the issue to personal impact. Again, this goes back to what Wailea was talking about at the top. This is what um, Amisha was talking about earlier also, or on Wednesday also in terms of engaging media. Help communities eliminate the complexities of this issue to really get to the root of student and community impact. Um, so with that, I don't see any a specific question. So I'm going to turn to you both for, you know, your closing thought recommendation tip and still encourage folks that you've got an opportunity to ask questions if you'd like. Yeah. So um, I wrote down two things, Jordan, two things, because it's important. So number one, and this, again, I admittedly think very much about like, who is, who has the most power, right? I spent a lot of my time focused on the people that had the most power because despite all of the existence of the school board and PCSB, a public charge school board, there's only really a few people in DC government that can actually do things from a budget perspective. Um, so the first thing is don't assume that your decision makers know what the problem is or that they share the same problem definition. And, um, you know, this came up in so many different ways, um, especially with ESSER, because if we think about the ESSER 3 and what uh, the American Rescue Plan required, that maintenance of equity requirement, we wrote a blog about that. We called out that there are certain equity provisions that the American Rescue Plan requires um, DC to meet. And we made sure we told advocates about that because then they could go into a meeting, right, with their ward council member or at-large member or the mayor or the chairman and say, this is what's supposed to be happening. You need to engage in oversight of D.C. public schools to make sure that they are not violating the provisions in this law. So it's really, really important that, you know, as you think about the fiscal cliff and how you want to engage around it, that when you go into your meetings, you are explaining what the problem is. And that relates to my second point um, that Jordan uh, just mentioned about keeping things simple and keeping things consistent among your fellow advocates. The worst thing you could do is confuse your decision makers about what they should do. They're hearing from a lot of different people. So the more you can have a large or loud, consistent message, the more likely you are to have success. And I'll just quickly give this example, not related to ESSER, but I co-led and co-founded co and co-led a 40 plus member organization um, that focused on student-based, uh, excuse me, school-based behavioral health uh, advocacy. And, um, it was a really, we ended up having a really complex budget ask because we were like, if this is scenario A, then this is the dollar amount we need. But if it's scenario B, this is the dollar amount we need. And it really led to a lot of confusion among the chairman, the, the committee chair of the committee of health, um, and then even the uh director um, of the agency of uh, Department of Behavioral Health, she was also confused <laughs> about where we were getting our numbers from. And um, it was almost too late for us to clarify and be more consistent in our messaging. And that was a lesson that we learned. And so as you all are going into your advocacy about the fiscal cliff, be consistent, not saying that you can't change like details, but your broader message should be the same so that you don't confuse anyone about what they should or shouldn't do as a next step. Thank you. Wylea? Um, So many. Um, I would say um, remove barriers to participation. And that sounds like a big one, especially, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this again, I have to reiterate, we do a lot, um, but it's because we have a lot of volunteers who want to do things. People want to do things, but if they don't know what to do and they don't know how and they don't know when, you know, I think Kobila's point is a good one. Um, we assume a lot of things about people, especially people who are in leadership, that we just can't, we can't leave things to assumption. 
right? Because then we are left lacking and then our communities are left lacking. And so um, remove barriers to participation and you can do that through volunteers, but if you give them specific and tell them exactly what you need, then they will be willing to step up and help you, right? Um, and so I would say remove barriers to participation um, in, in, in any way that you can. Um, and open yourselves up, open your organizations up to hearing from people who can give you suggestions on what that means. Because there's no real rule book, rule book. There's no real guidebook, right? Like all of my education still did not prepare me really, really for real for grassroots organization. And, and you know, but these are things that you learn boots on the ground. But also um, I, I opened myself up to help. And um, I had people remove that barriers to participation for me and it was beneficial. And so I try it every turn. We try it every turn, the Black and Brown Co Coalition to do the same. Because again, what is the cost of not doing whatever it is that we're doing and that we need to be done? What is the cost of not doing it? And thank you for having me here. Yes, thank you both. I think we could all um, hear from you both for so much longer and would encourage folks to stick around for the um, networking portion because many of our speakers have agreed to stay on and, and dive in deeper into those conversations. Um, but yes, thank you both. And I'll, I'll turn it to Clavila to, to take us out of here. Again, thank you, Walia. Um, super important information and reminders that you shared. So we are nearing the end of today's workshop, but we did wanna provide some opportunities uh, for networking and connecting. Um, we have breakout rooms that we are going to allow people to elect into um, centered they're, they're each organized around the topics that we covered both on Wednesday and today. We also have other um, at trust staff who are on the call and who will also be um, in the rooms in case uh, folks have questions um, about the organization or other things that we're doing around ESSER and, and engagement advocacy and advocacy. Um, and then some of our friends at CCSSO are still on the call and also available to, to answer more questions. So we're going to do this for the next, uh, Jordan, how long are we doing this until? About 15 minutes. Okay, the next 15 minutes. Um, and so Jordan, you can go ahead and let us select into things. Okay, the rooms are open, so folks should feel free to self-select um, what, you know, will help you the most in terms of connecting with folks. Mute because there's construction. <laughs> We don't have anyone in the addressing state and district fiscal cliff yet, so um, I don't know to what be, one. To be honest, it looks like it's mostly. I think most people have dropped, and yeah, it's just <laughs> our speakers. Yeah, it's just our speakers. So I think we should probably not <laughs> at this point. Okay, I'll so close the rooms and bring folks back. Okay, thanks. Avon, I did click close rooms, but can you help? Um, does that mean anyone who's not showing on the participant list is dropped off or can you help get them back in? 
<laughs> so I think all of the folks that's in the room is coming back in like 20 seconds, but I think that's all of the people that's in the action in the breakout rooms and the meeting. Okay, thanks. Hey, <laughs> so it was just all of the speakers um, in the room. Looks like folks dropped off, you know, uh, it is Friday. So we appreciate you staying on, Austin. We were hoping that we could have some um, enriching combos, but it looks like uh, folks, you know, made other plans, which is all okay. Um. So I, I think we'll wrap. Um, again, we really appreciate you, Austin, and Peter, and Beth, and Wailea for, you know, providing such rich information. We know that this honestly is one of many conversations that uh, we'll be facilitating um, and that you all will be facilitating as well about this because the impacts of the cliff are going to be felt for a while. This is not, you know, a one year thing. There's going to be a lot more work and advocacy and policy changes that we'll need to pursue at the state and district level. So again, thank you um, and hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. Great work, y'all. Thank you. Bye.